guys, we're going to wait a, a, one, just one minute so we uh, have uh, the opportunity to get all the participants on board. Um, as you know, this next session is about uh, white matter anatomy and uh, complex brain surgery. We're doing this, it is nighttime here in California now. Um, that is uh, morning time, I guess, in, in uh, Turkey and in, in Europe. Um, early morning, actually. And it's midday in China and Japan. So hopefully, and uh, in India is also around that, right? So not, not bad timing. So I wanted to organize this session. So we have an opportunity to have a session on that is in good time for, for that part of the world too. And uh, especially because we want to cover the topic of white matter anatomy and complex brain surgery, because it's such an important topic. It's not all about the skull base and the vascular, but uh, complex brain tumor is a key part of what we do. And uh, I am very happy with the panelists we have today. Um, of course, I want to highlight the special lecture that uh, Professor Ture will give us later, because Professor Ture has been, I would say, the initiator of, you know, the re-initiator of white matter surgery and, and interest in white matter anatomy since he started publishing in, in, uh, at, the, the, at the, the end of the last century. And many of us follow his studies and continue working in this field. Um, we have a, a great group of Turkish fellows also joining us that have done phenomenal work in white matter dissection uh, following Professor Jasavis and Tourist example. And uh, they work with Professor Rotten to get to do great contributions. Um, so uh, with, uh, without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and, and start with uh, Dr. Gongor from uh, Turkey. He's gonna talk us about white matter anatomy of the cerebrum. Uh, Dr. Gongor, please go ahead and feel free to uh, make any comments. Okay, uh, can I start sharing my screen? Yes, let me see, one second. There you go. Can I start now? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody from Turkey and good night uh, in the United States. Uh, I will talk about the white matter tracks of the cerebrum. Uh, we know all cortical uh, eloquent areas and the vessels, but now we know uh, underlying it, there is a complex white matter network under it, uh, them. It was simple before, but we know uh, it is more complex than before. For example, uh, these areas is related with the language and not only the uh, non dominant hemisphere, but also non dominant hemisphere. There are some regions related with the language. And to determine these areas, uh, we have some techniques. For example, uh, functional MRI, tractography, and intraoperative direct stimulation. But most of these techniques uh, is not important if you know the anatomy. For example, for ventricle, ventricular tumors, you, if you know the anatomy of the white matter tracts, you don't need the uh, functional MRI and interoperative direct uh, stimulation and tractography. Uh, we have some techniques to show what matter tracks. For example, uh, fiber dissection and to show their relationship to ventricles, transformation techniques, and tractography. You must know the surface anatomy uh, and the ventricle uh, to know uh, location of the all Tracks. Firstly, you must know the 
ventricle location, frontal horn, corresponds to pars triangularis and pars operacularis. Body corresponds to placental and postcentral gyrus, atrium and occipital horn, supramarginal gyrus, and posterior part of the temporal gyrus, and anterior part of the occipital lobe. And the temporal horn uh, corresponds to the anterior and mid part of the middle temporal gyrus. And as you see, they are uh, covered by the white metal tracks. Firstly, uh, when you can see the U fibers after the cortication, they connect the nerve uh, gyra. Then, after removing the U fibers, you can see super longitudinal fascicle two and three. Two connects to past the angularis and angular gyrus to the uh, anterior part of the frontal gyrus. Sorry. As you see, super longitudinal fasciculus two, and you can see the tree, it connects the supermarginal gyrus and the pars operacularis and pars uh, triangularis. And you can see the their relationship with the ventricle. And you can see from the superior, sorry. You can see from the superior and the next fibers, uh, it's the most known fibers from the everybody arcade fasciculus. It connects the uh, frontal lobe to the temporal lobe. And it relates with the language. And you can see the day relation, its relationship, the ventricles. And it's uh, related cortical areas. You can see frontal lobe, pars triangularis, pars operacularis to the anterior part of the temporal gyrus. We can see from the superior to arcuate fasciculus and its relationship to ventricles. And you can see it is uh, lying lateral to the uh, ventricle. The next fibers connecting with the superior temporal gyrus to the angular gyrus, middle longitudinal fasciculus. You can see its relationship to the ventricles, atrium, and the temporal horn. And you can see its cortical relationships with the superior temporal gyrus and the angular gyrus. And when we see from the superior, you can see middle longitudinal fasciculus and its relationship to ventricles and its cortical relationship. And inferior front to occipital fasciculus connect frontal lobe to the occipital lobe to the insula. You can see inferior front to occipital fasciculus, uncinat fasciculus, and then under the uh, temporal lobe, inferior lung nerve fasciculus. You can see the relationship with the ventricles. And the cortical relationship. And from the inferior view, you can see the inferior lung nerve fasciculus located lateral to the ventricles and anterior commissure when you remove the uh, eye fof, you can see anterior commissure and you can see tractography of the anterior commissure and the relationship the uh, cortical structure when we look from the superior you can see anterior commissure and their temporal and occipital extensions. And uh, it's uh, cortical relationships. 
and after removing the uh, posterior part of the anterior commissure, you can see the optic radiation uh, emerging from the lateral geniculate body and mirror loop then to the occipital lobe. And it's a relationship the ventricles and with tractography and you can see that there it's cortical uh, relationship. And when we look from superior, you can see the optic radiation covering the lateral part of the atrium and temporal gyro. And when we look to uh, inferior, you can see the optic radiation covering the lateral uh, wall of the atrium and the temporal horn. With tractography, and you can see the cortical relationship. And from the medial side, uh, we have spare longitudinal fasciculus one connecting the precuneus to the anterior part of the frontal lobe, and the cingulum connected to the frontal to the temporal lobe, and the relationship with the ventricles and the, the relationship with the cortical areas. When we look to uh, superior, you can see the cingulum and the superior longitudinal fascicular connecting the precuneus to the frontal lobe. And unsinate fasciculus connects the frontal lobe to the temporal lobe, just under the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. And you can see the fornix connects the interlimbic inter gyrus to the uh, mammillary body and the septal area. From superior, you can see unsinate fasciculus and the fornix. And corpus, corpus callosum is the major commissure of fibers of the cerebrum and it connects the most part of the cerebrum and it has parts, forceps major connects the both occipital lobe, forceps minor connects both frontal lobes and tapetum covers the lateral wall of the ventricles. And from the superior view, also, it has uh, different parts from connect to spur parts of the uh, cortex and connects caudal nuclei. And you can see the tapetal fibers, forceps minor and forceps major. And its relationship with the ventricles, it covers uh, upper wall and middle wall of the ventricles and also that's a wall of the ventricles. And corticus spinal tract and thalamic radiation. And uh, we described some of the uh, approach to the ventricles. And if you know the anatomy, you don't need most of the time, the uh, tractography and intraoperative uh, direct stimulation and functional MRI because you can know and uh, these all tracks. You can see all these data from these uh, manuscripts. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Tu and Roshagel to have it to get a chance, to give you a chance to work with them. And I'm working in the Lettitepe Neurosurgery Laboratory with my fellows. And also I'm uh, still studying for, for my cases. And I, I am doing uh, goodbye parties to my fellows as a tradition of the Professor Roton. And I want to thank uh, Pamir Tanova and uh, to my previous former fellows. And I'm lucky because uh, I had a chance to meet uh, legends and I'm part of the big family. Thank you, Professor Oton, and thank you for listening.
wonderful Dr. Gongor. That is a very nice presentation. We had a very good, interesting question on, on the um, questions and answers panel. So for the attendees, please, please feel free to, answer, to um, make any questions you have. But the question was, if fiber tracks are asymmetrical or not, do, do you have uh, an opinion on that, Dr. Gongor? Yes, it is not symmetrical. Uh, it can change the left and right side. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, left side on, or dominant side, hypertrascurus is more bigger than the non-dominant side. So, uh, this is some example of, of, for this question. This is not symmetrical. Correct. Yeah, exactly. So we studied this too, and we found that the arcuate track is the one that is mostly asymmetrical. Um, uh, clearly, uh, relation of, of uh, two thirds versus one third, um, and not only asymmetrical, but different connectivity areas than on the non-dominant side. Uh, so that's the main asymmetrical track. Um, perhaps we can hear more from our next speaker. Um, uh, Juan Martino, can you please, uh, um, um, Dr. Gungor, can you stop sharing your screen so we can go to the next speaker? So Juan is a colleague from Spain who has done a spectacular work over the years on white matter anatomy dissection, and also with a lot of experience in doing brain tumors and functional mapping for brain tumors. So I like very much his work because it's someone that is not just doing brain mapping, is doing brain mapping, but has deep anatomical knowledge. There is some controversy on whether, when to use my mapping, when not to use it. Some of the students that use mapping don't have good knowledge of the anatomy, in my opinion, that's a personal opinion. So I like the work that Martino does because it's based both on anatomy and mapping. And I'm looking forward to hear from him uh, and uh, what he has to say. So welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Carlos. Um, it's a it's a great uh, honor for me to be here. Um, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to give this uh, lecture uh, about the uh, subcortical uh, anatomy. <clears throat> so, um, So uh, I will uh, talk mainly about the um, associative uh, connections related to the Brazilian area, uh, mainly uh, to the uh, arco fasciculus uh, and superior regional fasciculus, but if I talk, I'm going to get to a discussion in this, uh, in these two tracks. Then the uh, middle longitudinal uh, fasciculus, the imperial longitudinal fasciculus, and then the tracks related to the uh, insula, that is the uncinate fasciculus and the imperial occipital fasciculus. And I will also talk a little bit about uh, the areas of uh, track intersection. So first, uh, the arco fasciculus, uh, Dr. Gongor has already talked about uh, this connection. Uh, <clears throat> um, this uh, connection is uh, composed mainly of three tracks. Uh, there is a long connection, a long uh, segment of the arco fasciculus, you can see here in red, that goes from the uh, frontal lobe at the frontal operculum at the presenter gerus and the uh, posterior part of the inferior and middle frontal gerus, uh, and then goes uh, at the level of the frontal and parietal operculum, turns around at the caudal end of the cingulate fissure, and goes inferiorly to connect to the uh, posterior temporal. Uh, Posterior temporal lobe here <coughs> at the level of the uh, inferior and middle temporal and the gyrus. We also have a, a vertical segment, a vertical connection that is lateral to the long segment here that connects the angular gyrus with the uh, middle temporal gyrus. And we also have a, a, a horizontal or anterior segment that goes from the uh, supramarginal gyrus to the uh, presential uh, gyrus. I know there is a lot of discussion related to the uh, names of all these connections and including also the superior longitudinal fasciculus as part of this uh, connection or uh, uh, only. <clears throat> so here is the dissection of this uh, long segment, the uh, arcuate fasciculus. 
Eh, that, as you can see here is the insula, that is section of the insula. And here we have open the operculum, the frontal, the parietal, and temporal operculum, and the temporal lobe. And you can see the, the direction of the fibers. And you can see how they go, how, how this fiber um, curves at the caudal end of the uh, insula. Here is the pars uh, orbicularis, pars glandularis, and pars opericularis of the inferior frontal gyrus. And as you can see, the main termination of this connection is at the level of the uh, ventral part of the presental belt. This is presental sulcus, so this is posterior to the presental sulcus, and it's at the level of the ventral part of the presental gyrus. So uh, this area is a very important uh, area of uh, fiber intersection that we study. Uh, the, the anatomy of this area. Here you can see the uh, pars uh, orbicularis, pars triangularis, and pars orbicularis, and here the uh, ventral part of the precentral gyrus. So here is the central sulcus, the postcentral sulcus, and the precentral sulcus. So at this level, we found that the arcuate fasciculus uh, terminates uh, at this level here with a specific organization. The uh, horizontal segment. The uh, or anterior segment terminates at the posterior uh, part of the presental gyrus. The uh, arcuate fasciculus terminates a little bit more anterior to that, and the pyramidal pathway at this level was displaced anteriorly, uh, so it was just posterior to all this uh, connection. This is a very important area because it's the, uh, the final speech output area, because here we have the, uh, the cortex of the uh, phonatory musculature. So at the end, the, the, the final pathway of the language terminates here and goes from here to the brainstem to the phonatory uh, musculature. So here is the area where we, uh, when we stimulate, we uh, normally identify the speech arrays. There is a combination, there is a, a complex uh, response because we have bottom response on the phonatory musculature, the, the tongue or the lips <coughs> or the larynx. And we also have uh, the uh, area of speech arrest, where the patient has a, a, an arrest of uh, counting. Here is the organization of this uh, specific uh, area. So <clears throat> with, uh, with this case, uh, I will explain the uh, surgery uh, where we have a tumor related to the alcohol fasciculus. Here we can see a, a temporal tumor. Uh, it's a recurrent low-grade glioma. It was previously operated. And at the superior margin of the tumor, we can see the vertical segment of the arcuate fasciculus and also the long segment of the uh, arcuate fasciculus. So at the posterior and superior margin of the tumor, we are expecting to find a function, a language function for the, in the left side. This is a left side tumor. So <clears throat> here is a, the MRI in the surgical position, in the surgical perspective. So here at the posterior and superior margin of, the, uh, of this tumor. We use interpretive electrical stimulation mapping with uh, bipolar stimulation with the patient away. Here is the uh, surgical view, so you can see here the head. Here is the craniotomy. There is the surface is a little bloody because they, as it's a recurrence tumor, the dura mater was attached uh, to the uh, cortex. So here we can find the uh, central sulcus is here, and here the uh, ventral part of the presental uh, gyrus. And here is where we say that is the termination of the arcuate and uh, long uh, anterior segment of the uh, arcuate fasciculus. So here is where we found the speech arrest area. Here is the tumor. Here is the cellular fissure. So here is the tumor. And at the posterior margin, where we were expecting, uh, at the level of the cortex, we found areas of anomia during the stimulation at uh, T1, at the superior uh, temporal gyrus, and also at T2. After doing the, the other section, uh, subcortically, we also find at the posterior margin of the section uh, language areas, again related to the connections of the arcuate fasciculus. Here you can see the postoperative uh, tractography. So we perform a postoperative tractography. Here is the resectional cavity. And at the posterior margin of the other section, you can see a postoperative tractography with a reconstruction again of the arcuate fasciculus. And we see a residual tumor. Related to the um, to the to the arcuate fasciculus, to these uh, functional labels related to the posterior margin of the resection. <clears throat> then we go to the uh, middle longitudinal uh, fasciculus. 
The media longitudinal testiculus, here you can see the arc of testiculus, the long segment of the arc of testiculus, as a uh, reference. Here we can see this, the insula. So this is the frontal operculum, very operculum, anterior operculum. So as you can see, there is a small track here in purple that, uh, that is connected to the uh, superior temporal gyrus and goes, uh, it goes uh, medial in the long segment of the arc of testiculus. So connects the, the superior temporal gyrus and terminates at the superior uh, parietal lobe and interparietal surface. This is the middle longitudinal testiculus. If you can, uh, it's sometimes confusing, and uh, you can confuse this track with the uh, vertical segment of the arc of testiculus, but in fact, it's very easy because the uh, uh, vertical segment is lateral to the long segment of the arc of testiculus, and the medial uh, longitudinal testiculus is medial to the long segment of the arc of testiculus. So you can see here very clearly the uh, the difference between these two connections. Here is a dissection of the uh, temporal lobe to find the uh, middle of the fasciculus. So here you can see the head and this arrow as a reference to know where we are uh, dissecting. Here is the cilia piso here. So all this is the temporal lobe. We have opened the temporal lobe <clears throat> at the level of the uh, uh, inferior the temporal sulcus. So this is superior temporal sulcus, middle temporal sulcus, and here. We have opened, like a book, the temporal lobe, and we can see here the arc of fasciculus, and medial to that, we see the uh, medial longitudinal uh, fasciculus. As you can see, medial to the long segment of the arc of fasciculus, these vertical fibers are the uh, long segment of the arc of uh, fasciculus. We can see here many of the tracks that we hear from the cilia fasciculus that we will talk uh, later. This is a surgical case where we identified a function related to the middle longitudinal fascicle. You can uh, find a, a frequently function of the superior temporal uh, gyrus related to the uh, middle longitudinal fasciculus. And in this case, we found a function at the level of the temporal pole, language function. Here is the tumor. It's a, again, a low-grade glioma, again, a recurrent uh, tumor. And we found that the anterior temporal lobe uh, was uh, connected to the middle longitudinal fasciculus. As you can see here, in green, this connection that is medial to the long segment of the arc of fasciculus. Here is, the, again, the surgical perspective. I think it's very important to review the cases uh, and the MRI in this uh, perspective to, to orientate you in surgery. <coughs> uh, so here is the uh, surgical, uh, surgical view, the craniotomy. Here is the cilia fissure, so this is the temporal lobe. And here uh, is the superior temporal uh, gyrus. So here is the tumor. And um, so we, do, we did a double section of the, uh, the, the tumor. So as you can see here, at the temporal bone, at the anterior part of the temporal lobe, we identified a function uh, here, a uh, language function here. Uh, areas of anomia here and here. This area was connected to the middle of the middle of fasciculus. And also subcortically, as you can see in this data here, we also find function related to this area. So this area was probably connected to the middle of the fasciculus. Here uh, a screenshot of the uh, neural navigation, where you can see that uh, this area, this label here, is related to this green track that is the middle of the uh, fasciculus. Then we go to the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. The inferior longitudinal fasciculus <clears throat> is not a very similar track. This track is located at the uh, at the basal temporal lobe. This track is a longitudinal connection that goes from the anterior temporal lobe to the posterior temporal lobe and the occipital uh, lobe. Here in blue, you can see the middle longitudinal in, in red. Uh, uh, you can see the difference between these two connections. So the inferior longitudinal testicles to find this track, we have to go through the inferior temporal gyrus. That's why uh, it's at the depth of the inferior temporal gyrus, and that's why I'm saying that it's uh, of, uh, away from the uh, perisilian, uh, from the operculum, from the perisilian uh, uh. Here we can see again the temporal lobe. We have opened the temporal lobe. Here we can see the arcuate fasciculus, middle longitudinal. This is the temporal horn with the hippocampus. And here we can see this connection that goes uh, longitudinal, so parallel to the malleable axis of the temporal lobe, and is the middle, uh, the inferior longitudinal. Uh, here and here. So it's very close. We have displaced a little bit, but it's very close 
the uh, temporal horn of the ventricle. So it's just laterally inferior to the temporal horn of the ventricle. Here we can see, again, the inferior ventricular uh, fasciculus. This is, a, again, a surgical case where we identify the function related in the inferior ventricular uh, fasciculus. So it's a tumor that infiltrates the temporal lobe and the insula. Again, the surgical perspective. So we are expecting to find the function at the inferior margin of the tumor and posterior margin of the tumor. So here, related to this area uh, here. This is the craniotomy, the uh, surgical uh, mapping, the cortical surgical mapping. Here is the tumor projection. So here, again, the speech arrest related to the ventral part of the central gyrus, and here, a various of animal. So we perform the resection, and again, at the inferior and uh, posterior margin of the resection, we identify these areas uh, of anomaly related to the inferior longitudinal fascicle. Where you can see the insular surface, the insular surface, so the temporal isthmus is here, the temporal stem, and here is related to the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, these two areas of anomaly. Is, here is a, again a screenshot of the neural navigation system, and here you can see the inferior longitudinal fasciculus related to these labels uh, here. Okay, and we go uh, now to the uh, uh, tracts related to the insula. We have two main connections related to the insula, the uncinal fasciculus and the inferior from occipital fasciculus, the tracts that cross to the insula. Uh, here you can see the arco fasciculus as a reference, the long segment of the arco fasciculus, and here you can see the projection of the insula. So here you can see the uncinal fasciculus in blue. Okay, it's a hook, uh, it's a new set uh, tract that goes from the uh, basal frontal lobe to the uh, temporal uh, pole, to the anterior temporal pole, and cross to the lumen insula here, and the anterior part of the lumen insula. And here is the inferior uh, frontal uh, fasciculus that, go, that is a long connection that goes from the parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe posteriorly. That goes medial to the arco fasciculus, as you can see, it's a big connection, crosses to the uh, temporal isthmus here, to the uh, temporal isthmus, then goes, uh, crosses uh, through the insula, again through the anterior and ventral part of the insula, and then it crosses the anterior uh, isthmus here to go to the frontal operculum and the basal frontal, and the frontal, the frontal gyrus, the frontal gyrus. Is the main connection, the connection anterior. <clears throat> so uh, you can see there are the uncinal is anterior to the uh, inferior from the occipital fasciculus at the level of the insula and also at the level of the temporal uh, of the temporal uh, isthmus. Here is the dissection of the inferior from the occipital fasciculus. We have removed the insula here. Here was the temporal lobe. We have removed also a big part of the temporal lobe. Here is the temporal horn with the hippocampus. Here is the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, which is placed posteriorly. And here we can see the uncinal fasciculus crossing to the insula, and the inferior from the occipital fasciculus crossing to the ventral and anterior part of the uh, insula. Here is another, uh, another section. We can uh, elevate this uh, inferior from the occipital fasciculus, as you can see here. And what we see below is the uh, optical radiations here. This is the optical radiations, okay, just below the inferior from the occipital fasciculus, <clears throat> and, uh, and here the lateral surface of the putam. Here is gray matter, the lateral surface of the putam. Uh, this is a surgical case where we identify function related to the inferior from the occipital fasciculus. The uh, tumor goes from the, front, from the temporal lobe uh, and gets in the insula. So here is the, uh, the tumor in the, in the surgical perspective. Here is the uh, tumor, the projection of the tumor at the temporal lobe here, and infiltrating also the insula. This is areas of uh, functional areas, speech arrest again, and anomalous areas here. And once we perform the resection of the temporal lobe, we identified here areas of semantic paraphrases at the level of the temporal isthmus that is related to the inferior from the occipital uh, fascia. But here, we identified areas of semantic paraphrases. The inferior from the occipital fasciculus is related. It's a drug in the left side related to language and is, uh, is part of the ventral 
a semantic screen. So stimulating this drug, we normally identify semantic prefaces. Here is again the tractography and the screenshot of the neural application to see how we identify this area here that is related to the, this label here is the distract uh, we do that is the impaired of intoxicant positive control. Here is the postoperative tractography where we identify the then a residual tumor related to the left impaired of intoxicant and fast control. Just to terminate the presentation, uh, I would like to talk about this area of the uh, fiber uh, intersection in the field. All these tracks, all these connections are uh, very close one to the one to the other. They are just separated a few millimeters uh, one to the other. So during surgery, it's very difficult to identify each track individually. We normally stimulate and identify a response where we uh, we really don't know if we are stimulating one track or the track that is uh, right in, in contact with the other. Track. As you will see, this, all these connections are here in this area here, very close one to the other. This area is the posterior part of the, uh, the temporal lobe and also the uh, inferior parietal lobe, especially the annular gerus, where there is an intersection of all these connections. So as you can see, there is the vertical segment of the arthro fasciculus, long segment of the arthro fasciculus here in, in orange, middle longitudinal fasciculus in red, is also intersecting here, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus is intersecting here, the inferior from the cervical fasciculus, the, uh, these are the optic radiations here, and we also have the uh, tapete in the corpus callosum just below these, uh, these uh, connections here. So if we go from medial to lateral, we have the tapete in the corpus callosum, you can see here, then the optic radiations, then the inferior from the cervical fasciculus, then the, uh, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, the middle longitudinal fasciculus, the long segment of the arco fasciculus, and the vertical segment of the arco fasciculus. So here, uh, if we stimulate here, it's very difficult to know if we are stimulating one track or the other. Okay, and if we uh, and it's a very important area because if we damage this small area here, we will induce a disconnection of practically all the associated uh, tracks of the hemisphere. We will damage if we go from lateral here to the ventricle, for example, and we cross all this connection, we will disconnect the, uh, the, the whole uh, hemisphere. So we will, uh, we will have to plan our trajectory uh, posteriorly or anteriorly, but never through this area here. This is the superficial projection of this temporal parietal fiber intersection area. Here you can see it's related to the uh, uh, angular gyros here and posterior part of the superior to the inferior and middle temporal gyrus. And here is the dissection of this uh, area of the fiber intersection. So you can see the long segment of the arcuate, vertical segment, uh, in middle longitudinal, inferior from occipital, crossing to the insula, that's here, you can see here the thumb and the ventricular straight arcuate, the optic radiations here, the uh, radius loop, the temporal horn with the hippocampus, and inferior longitudinal fasciculus in here. So here is the area of fiber and intersection in the area here. Yeah. Once, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Is is it possible to check on your sound because uh, it's it's not very clear? Uh, you ha there is a lot of echo. I don't know if there is anything you can do on your computer to make it better. Uh, okay. Maybe changing the microphone to a different microphone. I'm not sure you can make it. Maybe you cannot make it better. But Let I have see. many of the attendees that are complaining about the 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 sound with a lot of echo. Can you hear me now? Maybe it's better now. Try now, Albert. Let's see. Okay, so now you can hear? I think that's better, actually. Okay. So, yes, uh, things in my presentation. Uh, this is a final uh, case <clears throat> where uh, you can see the, um, where you can see the, um, the this temporal uh, tumor, this uh, posterior uh, temporal tumor related to the uh, inferior temporal uh, gyrus. So uh, this tumor is related to this uh, temporal, uh, temporal uh, parietal fiber intersection area here. As you can see, the superior margin of the tumor is, uh, is related to this area of fiber uh, intersection. Here is again the surgical uh, perspective, the surgical uh, view. So we are expecting to find function related 
in the superior uh, margin of the, of the tumor. Um, this is the uh, surgical uh, perspective, the, the craniotomy, uh, and here is the tumor uh, here. So at the uh, at the um, superior part of the at the superior part of the uh, of the, the tumor, we find we can uh, see these uh, labels here, these uh, two numbers. <coughs> And uh, once we have performed the resection, at the superior margin of resection, we identify subcortically many areas of uh, function here and here. So here is the tumor and uh, areas of function at the uh, white matter uh, here, alexia and anomaly. And this is the uh, postoperative tractography with a residual tumor related to this temporal parietal fiber intersection area. And you can see we have preserved the conditions uh, um, and uh, as we found the function uh, at the superior margin point of the tumor. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope, uh, sorry for the, for the problem with the sound. I hope you could uh, hear me. And, uh, and thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thanks, Juan. That was a very nice presentation in spite of the sound. Uh, you have a lot of expertise, which we appreciate. Um, I think there is a question from the panelists that I don't know if you, you would want to answer. Um, we talk about the asymmetry of the front of the uh, arcuate fasciculus. Do you think in a patient or person that is left dominant, strongly left dominant, that the arcuate tract is uh, dominant on the left, on the right hemisphere instead of the left? Excuse me? Do you think that we have a question about the asymmetry of fiber tracts? And we said the yeah. arcuate fasciculus is asymmetric in most cases. But if there is a patient that is left handed, um, yeah. strongly left handed, not both, just strongly left handed, in, do you think that uh, patient would have a stronger right arcuate fasciculus, asymmetric? Um, uh, probably, yes. Um, I think that the, the, the right arcuate fasciculus is also very important for many other functions related to, for example, to social cognition, uh, to prosody recognition, and to many other functions. So um, uh, I, I, in my dissections, I haven't seen many differences between both sides. You said that you preferably find like two thirds uh, left-sided and uh, one third uh, right-sided, no? The, the the yeah uh, the this asymmetry this uh, big asymmetry uh, in my experience I haven't find many asymmetries in this uh, in this uh, connection but uh, but yes probably in a very left sided uh, left handed patient uh, the language uh, will probably be located in the right side in the right hemisphere so um, uh, it will probably have a, a bigger uh, arco fasciculus but um, but in fact, as we as we saw in the presentation, uh, language is related to uh, all the connections at the same time. So I, I don't think we should uh, uh, focalize in the long segment of the arcofasciculus as a as a sign of uh, of lateralization for language, because in fact, uh, if there is a, a whole uh, connectivity, uh, vertical, inferior longitudinal, uncinate, inferior front occipital, all at the same time are uh, are the main connections. Uh, that uh, mediate uh, uh, language function. So uh, I don't know in, in this specific case if we will find uh, uh, many difference in, in both sides. Maybe uh, the same uh, laterality, but, uh, but uh, maybe other connections or, or the, 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 the combination of all the connections would be stronger in the, in the, in the right side in this, in this patient. Yeah, certainly a fascinating topic of research. Um, we also remember finding that the, the what we call the parietal Aslan tract or that vertical tract of the arcuate is also lateralized, uh, suggesting that's a very important, as you, you said, the temporal parallel junction is also very uh, eloquent for language, um, yes. as you also saw in your mapping studies. So um, that's great. Very good. Thank you so much, Juan. Probably, probably what you say that the, the is probably not the arcuate, but at least all these temporal parietal fiber intersection areas that combines all the connections, related, or mostly all the connections related to language, probably you could find a difference in, 
in, uh, in the anatomy of this area in a left side or, or, or in a left-handed or right-handed patient. Probably you could find a combination of all these connections. Exactly. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next we have with us, uh, I don't see any more questions for the participants. Please feel free to uh, type any questions and we'll address them as they come. Um, we um, have next uh, Julius uh, Zhu from uh, China. He's actually a fellow in, in my lab doing phenomenal research on medial temporal lobe anatomy and in particular the vascularization of the medial temporal lobe. So as you will see, we're going to focus also not only on white matter tracts, but on the microvascular anatomy that is very important to do, uh, certainly in the area of the medial temporal lobe. So um, Julius, please go ahead. All right. Uh, all right. So, so. I think Juan, perhaps you need the, to. Uh, the most dominant is the screen. screen. Uh, sorry. Thanks. And any of the panelists, um, uh, you guys feel free to make any comments at any point. Um, we want to make this interactive uh, uh, if possible. So could you see my screen? Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks for the kind introduction from Professor Miranda. And it's my honor to continue the uh, microsurgical anatomy uh, here and uh, follow the Professor Rotten's footstep in my career. And uh, so today, the topic of mine is the microsurgical anatomy of the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus artery. And actually, uh, this great project could be divided into two parts. The first part uh, is focused on the AVM surgery, which uh, published more than 10 years ago. And uh, of course, this paper is a milestone in the temporal lobe anatomy. And the second part, we focus on the hippocampus artery. Uh, actually, this uh, paper we have finished recently, and uh, I believe that the publication will come soon. So let's get to start from the part one. And uh, you could see this is uh, the left image shows the media surface of the temporal lobe. It could be divided into three parts, the anterior, middle, and the posterior segments. And the landmark we choose is the renal sulcus and the posterior limit of the uncle sulcus, the level of the quadrigeminal uh, plate and uh, the cocarine point. This is the details of each segment. And we also took an inferior view of the temporal lobe and uh, after resection of the parts of the parahippocampus, you could see this is the upper part of the uncus and also the fimbria and the dendrite gyrus has been revealed. And then we enter the temporal horn and you could see this is the roof of the temporal horn. The details of the male lobe and the uh, uh, temporal fibers has been revealed. And also this is the newer features of the hippocampus also could be divided into three parts, the head, body, and the tail. And this is the projection of the hippocampus in the internal and uh, uh, basal surface. This is the detail of the each segment. And uh, uh, we give the summary of each segment in the part one study. And you could see uh, the medial temporal reading is the most complex area in brain, not only because of it's a deep location, but also it includes a major component of the limbic system, such as the hippocampus, the parahippocampus, and the amygdala, and so on. And this is the neurovascular uh, relationship of the medial temporal region. And uh, you could see the anterior segment is irrigated by the MCA, ICA, PCA, and the SH. And the middle and the posterior segment is predominantly supplied by the PCA and uh, its branch. And we give the summary of the vascularization in the medial temporal region, which involved the nine arteries. And uh, let's get started from the uncus, the anterior segment. And uh, we give the illustration of the vascularization of the in uncus area. And uh, you could see how complex it is. And this is uh, from the uh, anatomic view. And uh, you could see the vascularization in the uncus and also the uncus sulcus. 
and uh, this is another specimen shows the similar uh, situation. And we also uh, use the Transylvania approach uh, to illustrate the arteries in this area. And you could see this is the anterior uncle uh, artery, and it irrigates uh, the seminal uh, gyrus. This is the anterior subtemporal approach, and you could see the anterior hippo artery. And uh, this is the media basal surface of the temporal lobe, and you could see the PCA is the main fitting arteries in the middle and the posterior segment. And the typical PCA has two bifurcations. Uh, one is the proximal one, and another is the distal one. And the basal, uh, the basal one is the predominant one in the medial temporal region. And uh, you could understand this uh, van in the different view. And also the variation of the basal van is very common. And you could see the hypoplastic. And uh, a discontinued uh, basal van was revealed in some specimen. And uh, this is in another uh, specimen shows the similar uh, situation. And also the angiography shows a discontinued uh, uh, basal van. And you could see the an anterior uh, pedunculate segment of the basal van was uh, drained uh, in, uh, inferiorly into the superior petrous sinus. And we give the summary of the variation of the basal van. And uh, you could see the location of the hypoplasty. Uh, hypoplast From these variations, you could understand how the basal van developed in embryology. And then let's uh, go to the second part. And uh, this is uh, the uh, paper in history, which uh, gave the systematically classification of the hippocampus arteries. And uh, we also indicated these arteries in our part one study. And this is uh, the venous system in hippocampus system. And uh, you could see three veins was involved and uh, they collect uh, the blood from the head, body, and the tail respectively. And uh, this is uh, the illustration of the location of these veins and the corresponding to our anatomic study. So let's get started from a stepwise dissection to understand the hippocampus artery. And this is the superior view and the parietal frontal lobe has been resected. So the temporal lobe and the hippocampus has been revealed. You could see the quarter plexus is covered on the superior surface of the hippocampus. And then uh, further dissections and uh, we focus the uh, hippocampus tail. You could see the spinal artery is run in the medial surface of the tail and the posterior longitude hippocampus van uh, was run in the posterior hippocampus sulcus and they drain the blood of the hippocampus tail and into the in internal cerebral van. You could see further dissections, the part of the hippocampus has been resected to reveal the uh, perforated ramus uh, from this fitting arteries. You could see the special relationship of the uh, hippocampus with this fitting arteries. And uh, this is the part of the tail and you could see posterior hippocampus artery from the rise from the spinal artery gives the blood supply to the hippocampus tail. And the uh, total resection of the hippocampus, you will meet the vessels in three layers. From the deep to the shallow is the screw base, the collateral uh, sulcus and the cocarine sulcus. And you can see very clear. And this is the basal surface of the temporal lobe is corresponding to, to this. You could see this uh, uh, vessel is the branch of the PCA. And actually, there is the branch of the anterior, middle, and the posterior ITA. So we give the summary of uh, this uh, samples. Uh, you could see there are two arteries. One artery is from SHA and another artery is from the PCA, give the blood supply to the head. And the two arteries uh, irrigated uh, the body and the one artery, spinal artery, irrigated uh, the tail. So this is another specimen, also a stepwise dissection and uh, shows the similar situation. You could see this uh, perforated ramus. And uh, in some studies, this ramus was called the intrahippocampus artery system. And uh, to these samples, there is something different with uh, the previous. You could see there only one artery gives the blood supply to the head, and the two arteries give the uh, body is, uh, is the same 
But uh, to the tail, there are two arteries. One is the spinal artery, and another is the posterior hippocampus artery. And to the samples, you could see the special relationship of these two arteries. The spinal artery is runs uh, between the isthmus and the spinium, and the posterior hippocampus artery runs anterior the spinium. This is the illustration from the Professor Yasati in 1993. And, uh, uh, he used the H1, H2, H3, H4 to illustrate this uh, complex artery. I think in our study, we uh, figured out uh, what's, uh, what's the name of it. So this is uh, from the uh, basal view, from the inferior to the superior, also a stepwise dissection. And you could see part of the hippocampus that has Parahippocampus gyrus has been resected uh, to reveal the vascularization in the uncle sulcus. And uh, further dissections to reveal all of the uh, vessels uh, in the hippocampus. And uh, you could see how this artery is, uh, goes in the uh, hippocampus sulcus. And uh, to this uh, uh, specimen, is the same situation with the previous one. And you could see in the tail, in the tail, there are only one artery, spinal artery, gave the uh, irrigate this region. And this is the total resection, shows the temporal horn. And we also imitated the anterior hippocampus lobectomy to reveal uh, these arteries. And you could say this is the hippocampus body, and uh, the arteries. Uh, Run, runs in the hippocampus uh, sulcus that has been revealed. Actually, this is the posterior hippocampal parahippocampal artery. It's irrigated the hippocampus body. And uh, this is the PCA. Uh, it's the pint, uh, it's the pint vessels. And so this is the media surface of the uh, anterior uh, temporal lobe. And uh, you could see the arteries runs uh, in the uncle sulcus and the hippocampus sulcus. And we also imitated the trans-Silvian, trans uh, approach uh, to illustrate the hippocampus artery. And uh, this is the temporal horn we entered. And you could see this is the amygdala and this is the hippocampus head. The uncle recess is between them. And when the amygdala was the restriction and all of the since uh, the ICA and the, the op and the optic nerve has been revealed, and the further dissections so we resect uh, the uncus uh, and uh, the hippocampus head, and you could see the vessels running the uncus sulcus. So it's very complex. This is uh, the uh, venous system. This is the anterior. Uh, hippocampus vein. It collects the blood from the hippocampus head, and this is the an anterior longitudinal hippocampus vein. It collects the blood from the body. So for the dissection, we resect the hippocampus body, and you could see two arteries was revealed. Uh, so these two arteries is the post posterior hippocampus, parahippocampus arteries from the PCA. It irrigates uh, the hippocampus body. So this is the final aesthetical field. You could see all of the branch of the uh, PCA has been revealed. And we also uh, revealed some of the variations to the hippocampus the artery. And you could uh, take this specimen, for example, you could see the uncle hippocampus artery from the PCA is very strong. So the anterior hippocampus, the parahippocampus artery is predominantly irrigated the hippocampus body. So this is something different with the previous. And to, for this, uh, take this specimen, for example, you could see uh, the posterior hippocampus, uh, parahippocampus artery is very strong. It not only gives the blood supply to the body, it also gives the blood supply to the tail. So there's no additional posterior hippocampus vessels from the PCA. And we also uh, give the illustration of the vascularization of the hippocampus. So that's all. At, uh, so thanks. So thanks for all, all of your attention. And at last, I would like to thanks. Uh, send my best wishes to these conferences. So thanks. Thanks, for Professor Miranda. Thank you, Julius. That was a nice presentation. You know, that's very complex microvascular anatomy but actually very important to understand for, uh, you know, performing good surgery in the middle temporal lobe, both for ABMs and for 
uh, tumors um, and lobectomies for epilepsy perhaps too. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, continue with the next topic, which is about uh, my, uh, I would say going beyond brain mapping for medial temporal lobe tumors. How, how do we apply the anatomy to remove tumors in the medial temporal lobe? As Professor Rotten would say, the brain is the jewel of creation. And we wanna be able to preserve as much of the brain as we can in our operations. Every part of the brain should be respected as much as possible uh, when we perform uh, resections in our operations. I want to start by, you know, remembering this very important paper that uh, Dr. Ture published, you know, already 20 years ago. Um, imagine that. And this paper influenced me very deeply, as I think a whole generation of, of us, um, because it was a paper that shows us how to start learning about the anatomy of the brain. Many, many, probably as uh, it happened to me, many of you, I was disappointed when I was going to the operating room as a junior, as a junior resident and I was seeing brain surgeries done uh, without understanding of the fiber tracks or what was going inside. Everything was looking the same. But with this technique, we were able to actually understand some of those connections and the anatomy, intrinsic anatomy of the brain. And uh, that has stimulated many of us to start doing fiber dissection studies. And at the same time, we started doing also fiber tractography studies. DTI started about that time. So it was a perfect time, perfect coincidence of the initiation of or reinitiation of white matter dissection studies and the, uh, the beginning of fiber tractography as, a, uh, as an imaging technique. I put this picture here because uh, someone in the audience was asking about the, uh, the arcuit fasciculus and the connectivity. And we studied this in the lab, uh, doing dissections and correlating with fiber tractography. And we studied the difference between right and left hemisphere. And uh, we actually uh, got a very large database. This is a template of 500 Soviets uh, together. And you can see how they are clearly asymmetric. Usually the thinner one is the right side the thicker one is the, is the, is the uh, um, left side. So there is um, asymmetry in the arcuate fasciculus and that relates to the role of this tract into uh, language function. Of course, it's not the only tract that is relevant for it, but it's a uh, very important player in the, language, in the language system. There are other tracts that are also interesting and controversial. And there is the inferior front occipital fasciculus you heard about and uh, uh, we also study it and different segmentation patterns, uh, but I wanted to go back and say, should we call this the inferior front occipital or just the front occipital fascicle? If uh, uh, you may remember uh, Dr. Ture's actually first paper on uh, the superior front occipital fasciculus was an uh, anatomical study showing that that fasciculus doesn't really exist. And years later, um, uh, we actually did this study with fiber tracking just to uh, corroborate that with imaging studies, it demonstrates that the superior frontal fasciculus does not really exist, at least the way it was described. So important anatomical research. But when we talk about the temporal lobe, of course, we also care about the optic radiations. And you see this nice dissection here with the optic radiations and the correlation with fiber tracking. And you can look at the amygdala in front of the optic radiations. And you can see this is the view from the ventricle. And you look at the amygdala and the location of the optic radiations, you can realize that if you're going to go into the temporal horn and you want to preserve the optic radiations, the best way of doing it is going from the front, going from the amygdala and from the uh, limen insula to get access into the uh, temporal horn without disrupting the anterior part of the optic radiations. Um, also look in this dissection at the optic tract as a very important landmark when you're doing your operations. The optic tract re or represents your upper limit of your uh, surgical resection. Years ago, we put this paper together. We reviewed all these fiber tracks and correlated them with, with, uh, with, fiber, with fiber tractography. But we also studied, as Julio showed, the anatomy of the medial temporal lobe. And it was uh, Professor Evandro Oliveira who um, divided the medial temporal lobe in three segments, anterior, middle, posterior in a didactic way to 
decide which approach to use for each area. And we have studied the different approaches also in the lab and how to approach anterior, middle, and posterior segments of the middle temporal lobe. The middle temporal lobe has an extraventricular component, which you see here, but it has an intraventricular component. And that's why it makes it so tricky, understanding the correlation between intra and extraventricular components is uh, not an easy task to do. But here you can see the anterior part of the uh, middle temporal lobe is formed by the uncus. And the uncus has an anterior segment, which is the amygdala, and a posterior segment, which is the head of the hippocampus. Then the middle segment is the body of the hippocampus. And then the posterior segment is the tail of the hippocampus and the atrium. So when we look at the anterior segment, we look and look here at the extraventricular surface. We can look at the uh, uncus, and we see the prominence of the amygdala anteriorly, and then the uh, head of the hippocampus, the extraventricular portion of the head of the hippocampus that we're going to find in surgery. And a key anatomical uh, landmark is the uncal sulcus, because the arteries are going to go into the uncal sulcus, as Julius showed. And we need to find those arteries, dissect them, and coagulate them when we want to remove tumors from this area. As we move posterior, we can see the body of the hippocampus, the extraventricular portion with the fimbria and the dented gyrus and the subiculum, or the part of the parahippocampal gyrus, and then the fimbria that separates or connects the fimbria, I mean, the uh, corid uh, fissure that connects the fimbria or separates the fimbria from the thalamus. And opening this choroidal fissure is another key step when we do surgery on the medial temporal lobe. So we need to also understand the microvascular anatomy, anatomy and you showed very nice examples uh, just uh, before me. And the anatomy of the uncus is complex because there are three different arteries contributing to the anatomy of the uncus, to the vascular anatomy of the uncus. We have the choroidal artery, but we also have the middle several artery giving branches to the uh, outer surface of the uncus. And then we have the PCA giving a strong vascular supply. And remember the choroidal artery and the PCA give branches that go into the uncal sulcus that need to be identified. So here we describe the different vascular territories for MCA, anterior choroidal, and PCA at the level of the uncus. This is a work that I did together with Professor Evandro Oliveira, mostly focused on understanding the vascular anatomy for AVMs, um, but also applies to uh, tumors uh, in this area. So again, the uncal sulcus, we are opening it here. You see two arteries going in, one from the choroidal artery, uncal hippocampal artery, one from the PCA, the anterior hippocampal, parahippocampal artery. And in this other specimen, there is no branch from the choroidal. It's all coming from a very strong hippocampal, parahippocampal artery from the PCA. And you can also see the venous drainage of the hippocampus. So in this, this is a temporal insular glioma but I'm just going to show you the very last portion where we are removing the head of the hippocampus that is bigger than normal because he has a low grade tumor inside. And you see, we are opening there the choroidal fissure. And as we open the choroidal fissure, we need to continue the disconnection anteriorly along the uncus. And we need to find the brainstem uh, medially and respect the arachnoid. So here we see the fimbria. And I'm going to continue opening the choroidal fissure where I can see the choroidal artery, as you see right there. And as we keep disconnecting the uncus posteriorly, we find right there the uncal sulcus. And that's the uh, branch from the choroidal artery entering the uncal sulcus that we are right now coagulating and dissecting. And now we can follow the choroidal artery into the choroid plexus. We need to preserve the choroidal artery, of course, and just coagulate selectively the branches going into the hippocampus. That one we just coagulated, that's a branch from the PCA going also to the uncal sulcus and anterior hippocampal, parahippocampal artery. So it makes a big difference when you do these operations to understand the microvascular anatomy. So you can do a very meticulous operation when you disconnect vessels in a selective way. We also talk about the uh, anterior choroidal and the lateral posterior choroidal artery the basal vein system and the variations in the venous drainage that we reviewed before is very important to understand basal vein variations. Also for the skull vein surgery, as sometimes this basal vein can drain into the tentorium, you need to be always uh, looking for that, or it can drain into the inferior petrosal vein. 
Uh, those are rare variations, but they can also drain anteriorly the whole basal vein system. So all those variations need to be understood uh, well before you do your, your operations. So I'm going to show you some uh, case examples. And uh, this is a young patient with uh, a history of radiation in the past. And uh, uh, you see he has a tumor on the uncus of the temporal lobe. And uh, this patient presented with seizures. And if you look at this tumor, uh, some brain tumor surgeons are going to recommend going a transcortical approach to this tumor. They call it a transcortical equatorial approach uh, to the tumor. And this is a type of um, uh, uh, procedure that I do, I do not like because you have to cross normal brain to get into the uncus when you have a much more elegant way that is not only elegant, but is a way to preserve a lot of the temporal lobe um, without disrupting any. And the temporal pole is actually an important part of the brain and is good to keep that intact as much as possible. So we prefer to do, as Professor Jasselke described many years ago, a selective approach to the uncus and this doesn't require any brain mapping. There is no mapping involved here because you're gonna go directly to the uncus and there is no function to map in that area. However, you need to understand very well the microvascular anatomy on this uh, region and uh, be uh, familiar and comfortable with microvascular uh, dissection. So this is opening the, uh, uh, the sylvian fissure uh, carefully and it has to be a wide split and you need to be uh, working around the MCA branches. And as you will see, there is always very often a uh, inferior, uh, an inferior insular vein that you can use as a landmark at the level of the inferior insular sulcus. Um, there is also often a, an early temporal branch as you see right here, that is in your way to the uncus and you need to carefully mobilize uh, this uh, artery. If it gives some supply to the uncus, you can take those little vessels uh, because that's going to the area of the tumor. And you can see that basal vein uh, draining uh, anteriorly to the inferior insular vein connecting. So we need to keep opening. Uh, but the beauty of this is that you can identify, for example, the lenticular straight arteries. And those are very important arteries to identify because they form the roof, the upper limit of your resection. And I like to see them so I know where they are and I know how to preserve them. I like to also see the third nerve and dissect the arachnoid of the third nerve so I can separate the uncus from the third nerve. So this is an operation that is done extra and intra, uh, intraaxial. Extraaxial because you go around it, define third nerve, define the lenticular steroides, then intraaxial because you go into the tumor, into the temporal horn. Once you have the anatomy displayed, then you can start uh, entering the uncus and the amygdala, also a little bit of the planum uh, polare, but you're going to restrict how much you go posteriorly to prevent injury in the optic radiations. And I can attack the uncus from inside and from outside. And then I can go from inside, I can go into the temporal horn, and then I want to find my colloidal fissure medially. And then I'm disconnecting the uh, uh, head of the hippocampus. Laterally, I have the collateral sulcus, collateral eminence and collateral sulcus, which corresponds. And that's my lateral limit. That is the fimbria. And we are disconnecting the fimbria. You see the choroid plexus and you see the uh, uh, basal vein deeper. And we want to see the choroidal artery. And you want to keep the arachnoid intact around the anterior choroidal artery, but you need to coagulate the vessels going to the uncus, as we said, uh, as we said before. And when you do an operation uh, like this, the post-op looks really nice because it's um, a very selective tumor resection with preservation of all the tumor around it. And that I believe is a more efficient approach than just crossing the temporal pole. Even more important, you're dealing with a low grade glioma in a young patient like this with a history of seizures. Um, and especially this is left side dominant hemisphere um, so these patients will get cognitive dysfunction post-op to some degree if you do a transcortical approach, I believe. But if you do a trans uh, sylvian approach selectively, you can actually, I believe, get a better uh, outcome. It can be difficult because this case, for example, you see it has a very difficult sylvian fissure. It has, you know, three or four veins running 
and is a very busy sylvian fisher with veins all very uh, stacked to the other um so but you don't have to give up and it, if if you uh have the skills you can actually separate the veins and work your way into the fissure and uh, you will be able to get to your target to the uncus after some work i remember when i was doing this case with my residents they thought i was gonna I, I, you know they didn't believe you could go and open the fissure when it's that complicated um, because they are not used to see these selective approaches to the medial temporal lobe they are more used to the transtemporal approach. It's easier to you go maybe transtemporal, but it really, I don't think it's easy for me because I don't have the landmarks I need when I go through the brain. If I go this way, I can now see the uncus. I start seeing the uncus uh, right here, and uh, I can have all the landmarks I worry about. And even in a case like this, where there is a very strong vein attachment drainage anteriorly, I can dissect the vein and uh, work around it, get an office space. Now we are finally in the uncus right here. And that's some of the tumor. And that was the a large PCOM. And this, this is the third nerve. So some of the tumor that is growing outside the uncus. And again, I have malenticular steroid arteries very well identified and they form my roof. And it's very important to be very meticulous with these lenticular steroid arteries. This I am not sure yet whether they are going to the uncus or to the, or to the anterior perforated substance. So you need to, before you coagulate them, you need to make sure they are going to the uncus and not turning around into the anterior perforated substance. Usually, medially is lenticular steroides, laterally is to the uncus. Once you get to the uncus, things become much easier because now you start gaining a space. As you remove the uncus, you get to the amygdala you find the third nerve anteriorly, you find the enterocoidal artery, and that is the branch from the enterocoidal artery to the uncal sulcus we are coagulating. But I need to get a bit more posterior for which, as we did before, we have to mobilize this uh, early front of early temporal branch and work around this branch. So you have to be careful with those branches and sometimes they can get into a spasm. So you need to use some um, uh, nimodipine or papaverine, depending on your preference. Uh, selectively quadrant now, those were MCA branches. And now we can see the choroidal artery, the basal vein, and the choroidal fissure here. And I find the optic tract, as you see right there, my upper limit, my reference, the choroid plexus posteriorly. And now when I see the choroid plexus, I know that I'm already in the body of the hippocampus and I have completely removed the head of the hippocampus where the tumor was located. And again, this uh, beautiful operation to do and you get a nice post-operative view of this lesion uh, with selective removal of, of this tumor and preservation of the uh, neocortex around the tumor. Now when tumors extend more posteriorly into the body of the hippocampus they become more challenging and this is an example of a panhypocampal tumor in a patient that has nearly normal neuropsychological testing presents again with seizures. So a tumor like this um, I don't think it can be removed in one single stage because it expands all the way to the posterior segment of the middle temporal lobe. And you have to plan these operations in a way that you would do it, you, you want to do it in two stages. Um, again, uh, some students propose to do this in a transcortical way, but you see at the post op pictures down here, there is a lot of temporal lobe that has been removed in order to get this hypocampal tumor out. And if you do this in the left side, uh, even if you do it with mapping and you think you preserve language function, you are taking out of normal tumor, normal uh, brain that is not tumor and that, in my opinion, should not be removed. You see mapping to remove normal brain, brain uh, to get access um, might make sense, in my opinion, in some areas like the posterior superior insula, where it's difficult sometimes to get access. So getting an opercular resection in that area uh, 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 makes some sense. but. In an area like this, you can get good transsylvian access. I don't uh, think, at least I don't like to do myself. Um, so this is again, the view of, this, of the, this hippocampal tumor. And I don't need to do mapping for this tumor uh, because I'm gonna go uh, transsylvian and the temporal cortex is gonna be uh, lateral to my, to my approach. And the tumor has actually created some space for you to work as you, go, as you get into the ventricle. And uh, 
you can see the vascular anatomy in this case, you can see a very large basal vein draining. And you can see how the temporal horn can be used as an avenue to get into this tumor. We can do pre-op fiber tracking, and this shows the fiber tracks that are around the tumor, but they are not in your way if you come from a transylvian approach. If you come to a transcortical approach, you're gonna disrupt some of these fibers. And you see all the fiber tracks that surround this tumor. They are all superficial to the hippocampus, but if we come transylvian, we'll be able to preserve uh, this tumor nicely. So in this case, we've opened the fissure already. This was an easy one to open. You see again, our approach going to the uncus, going to the amygdala. You can tell when you get to the amygdala, it's a bit more grigious, a different, bit different consistency. You can see deep there, that is the amygdala right here. And once I see the amygdala turning posterior right here, you are in the temporal horn. And then I need to have my landmarks laterally, collateral sulcus, medially, the uh, choroid plexus, a choroidal fissure that you see right there, anteriorly, the third nerve, superiorly, the uh, optic tract and the lenticular steroid arteries. And again, we very often have to skeletonize this early uh, temporal branch. And then I disconnect all the way, I see the tentorium because I'm disconnected along the collateral sulcus, my lateral disconnection. Now, and the bulk is some of the tumor to facilitate dissection. You can see the third nerve and the PCA and doing the extra uh, extrinsic work. And now again, finishing my disconnection of the uh, fimbria medially. And I try to keep the arachnoid to protect those vessels. I think that's important for the choroidal artery and some other perforating branches. And this is the uh, final disconnection of the fimbria. And you can see the choroidal artery right here going to the choroid plexus and this is what remains of the fimbria and that tip of the uncus uh, more anteriorly. And this beautiful white is the brainstem, the cerebral peduncle. And as you go above, you will see the optic, the optic tract. You can see nicely both the anterior choroidal artery and the hippocampal vein and the choroid plexus. Now, how do you get more posterior? I think it's important to have uh, a good head position and a good orientation of your microscope so you can look posteriorly. And now we're looking all the way to the uncus without having to extend or incision along the inferior insular sulcus too much. Uh, this patient actually will get a quadrantonopsia um, very likely because we're getting more posterior, but that's a you know, relatively mild deficit. And then we can continue removing all the tumor in the body of the hippocampus all the way to the atrium. I cannot get more I cannot work in the atrium, but I can get up to that level. And you see right there, you see the atrium, that was the tail of the hippocampus. You can, I can tell I'm in the atrium because I can, I can see the bulk of the corpus callosum the, and the calcareves. And you see the temporal bridge veins are, have also been, been preserved. So this patient did very well from this first stage. He got some naming difficulties for just a few days. But those are transient, it's just because of your you know, mobilization of the temporal lobe. But you see post of fiber track in there. The fiber tracks are mostly intact. The arcuate fasciculus is intact laterally, and most of the optic radiations are preserved. And you can see the comparison of before and after how the vast majority of the fiber tracks have been uh, completely uh, preserved with a good tumor resection. Now we can see the post-operative uh, view again, and this is eight weeks post-op, and I'm planning to take him back to the OR for a second stage. The, this was planned. You see the nice uh, tumor cavity and the uh, neocortex preserved laterally. But there is a little bit of tumor left uh, in the posterior aspidal hippocampus, as you will see here. And this tumor is in the uh, ambient system and also pointing towards the quadrigeminal system and is in this area right here. So actually, when I presented this at tumor board, they recommended radiation for this. And I actually disagreed. And I said, I think it's better. I talked to the patient. I think it's better to do a resection of this tumor. It's a low grade. And it's better to resect it completely. So um, instead of doing radiation. So we uh, then proceeded. And we did a different approach, of course. We went from posterior 
as you know, has been described by Jasa Hill, uh, Ture, Vandro de Oliveira, this uh, nice uh, supracerebellar transdentrial approach that gives you access to the middle and posterior aspect of the uh, hippocampus. And uh, here he's doing the approach. This is in a, a, uh, a sitting position. And uh, you can also do this in a, in a lateral position if you position the patient uh, properly. But the beauty of this is as soon as you go uh, supra paramedian, supracerebellar, and you open the arachnoid, you're going to see the, the tumor. This is the fourth nerve down here and the uh, SCA. And uh, all this is the tumor right here. And now, and yes, carefully dissecting the tumor from the uh, brainstem. But of course, this tumor does not belong to the brainstem. It just attached to the arachnoid, but you can detach it. But you have to cut the tent because you only can access half the tumor without cutting the tent. Uh, so you really need to uh, do a good transaction of the tentorium tailored to the, to the case. And after you cut the tent, you can uh, access the supratentorial space and then get access to the, to the tumor. And you're going to see a nice view of the PCA right here. This is where the PCA bifurcates into parietoccipital and calcarine uh, branches. And deep, you can see the basal vein of Rosenthal as it approaches the, uh, uh, the vein of Gallen. And after you have surrounded the tumor, you're going to start debulking it. And that will facilitate a further dissection of the uh, tumor from the brainstem surface and all the microvessels. So we can uh, carefully dissect this tumor uh, uh, completely. Now, always a challenge is the uh, parietoccipital artery that is in your, in your way, and you need to dissect it very carefully. Um, you can take the branches that selectively go to the, to the tumor, but you need to keep the main vessel uh, intact and make sure there are no impassage vessels that you need to preserve. But with careful technique, you can escletonize the artery. You can see the basal vein, uh, very nice view of this anatomy. I, I just believe, as Julio said, you know, the anatomy of the middle temporal lobe is one of the most beautiful in the in the human brain. And this is a type of operation that I really enjoyed. And at the end of the resection, we're opening the atrium, but now from posterior. And that tells us that we have uh, completed the uh, uh, tumor resection. And uh, this is actually an easy uh, craniotomy. It's paramedian. Um, you only expose one transverse sinus but it's very important to expose a transverse sinus in your craniotomy. So you can actually put a stitch in the tent and get some, some more extra, extra space. And this is the uh, uh, post-operative MRI of the patient with uh, a complete uh, tumor resection. Again, using the anatomy to perform uh, this type of uh, tumor resection as uh, Professor Vandro so, showed us, you know, the art of microneurosurgery apply to tumors of the medial temporal lobe. Thanks very much. I will be happy to take any uh, questions or comments if anyone, uh, anybody want to make any comments. Um, if not, we'll jump to our uh, next speakers. Let me see if we have any questions. Okay, so we our next speaker is uh, um, Dr. Akakin, also from Turkey. Um, I believe he's going to talk about wide matter tracks of the cerebellum, another area with where fiber tracking has uh, really influenced and increased our knowledge. Yeah. Good morning and uh, good evening uh, to everybody and to all the world. And uh, I would like to thank to everyone who organized this beautiful meeting. And uh, I want to hi to all my uh, fellow friends and uh, they are good dissector and they are going to deeper and deeper. And uh, thanks to, to all to, for their contribution. I also congratulate uh, Abu Zer, uh, who came up for dissection on Sunday morning in the Turkey. And uh, if the back is not photo, <laughs> and the images like uh, classic rotten morning uh, in Abu Zar's screen. 
And uh, there are a number of approaches uh, to post post in brain surgery, to occipital, transplantorial, cerebellar, uh, uh, presigmoid, retrosigmoid, collateral, telebular. And uh, there are uh, more than 10 approaches uh, have been described, especially in post post uh, But uh, this place is very hard uh, to reach because there's a thick bone in here and the handle the surgery in safe is very hard in here because it's very limited space. Uh, and after muscle and skin dissection, we are reaching to the cerebellum. Uh, there are 26 approximately million cells in the billion cells in the cerebellum. This number is a uh, one third of the brain, uh, but it's an organ uh, that has been ignored for many years. However, as the years progress, uh, the patients ask if my quality of life will change rather than ask if I will be paralyzed. So this uh, structure will be more value in the future uh, in the course of time. Uh, the cerebellum has uh, three surfaces and uh, this is the tentorial surface. Uh, this three surfaces, tentorial surface, petrol surface and suboccipital surface. And the intentorial surface, there's, it consists of two lobes uh, and the vermis in the midline. And there's a tentorium to superior to this surface. Uh, anteriorly, simple quadrangular lobule and the uh, uh, superior semi lobule can be seen. And the uh, Kuhlmann and deck leaf and the folia uh, can be seen in the midline. And the supratentorial root is uh, used in this uh, in the surgery in this way, and uh, there is there should be a simple lobule. Uh, it's hidden just inferior to the uh, quadrangular lobule. And uh, there is another surface is uh, suboccipital surface. Uh, suboccipital surface is consists of the uh, lingula, uvula, and the pyramid in the midline. And there is a bilaterally ventral uh, lobule, and the anterior to this, there is a tonsil. And the posterior to the uh, ventral lobule, there is a, a, a inferior seminal lobule that's uh, separated from superior seminal lobule with the horizontal fish. And then another one is the third surface, is the petrol surface. And the petrol surface of the pontin. Uh, anterior part of anterior surface of the cerebellum and there is a huge and important structures uh, pontin is localized in here and it consists of the majorly middle cerebellum pedicle fibers and the, uh, there are seven eight and all the cranial nerves except one two three uh, arising from this surface so this surface is very important also there is a uh, Floculus and Foramen Lushka is located uh, in this uh, surface. And if we look closer, we can see that the pontus cerebral angle, and there's a Foramen Lushka in here with the Bohadelic bunch of flower appearance of the choroid plexus and the seven, eight, and the six, uh, seven, eight, and nine nerves complexes can be seen uh, in this structure. And the appendium of the Foramen Lushka is. Uh, it can be seen in the Bohodelic uh, bunch of flower. And if we go on from the superior surface, if we remove the quadrangular lobule, there are simple lobule is can be seen. And uh, it's uh, we can also observe the, some part of the inferior cerebral pedicle fibers and middle cerebral pedicle fibers uh, just under the quadrangular lobule. And uh, if we remove the quadrangular lobule, simple lobule can be seen easily. Uh, we can also observe the superior cerebral pedicle and the middle cerebral pedicle fibers. And uh, if we cut the, and uh, remove the superior cerebellar pedicle and the superior uh, medullary vellum, uh, fourth ventricle floor view uh, can be seen. And the middle cerebral pedicle is laterally, and the nodule and choroid plexus just in the midline. And we can, if we look inferiorly, we can see the passive corpus and the up to centrifuge places in the fourth ventricle floor. 
And uh, if we go on the dissection from the anterior to the posterior, we can see the some medial lanuscus fibers and the rectus uh, just superior level. And uh, we can see some medial lanuscus fibers and the retinal fusus. And uh, uh, we can see the middle cerebral pedicle fibers. It's cutting. And uh, there is a trigeminal nerve that's passing between the middle cerebral pedicle fibers. And uh, this view is from the anterior to the posterior. And when we go to dissection from the uh, superior to inferior, and then technicus can be seen. Uh, in the inferior to the quadrangular lobule and the superior seminal lobule, just lateral to the uh, dentaticus, there's the uh, middle cerebral peduncle fibers, and superior to the uh, dentaticus, we can see the superior cerebral peduncle uh, fibers can be seen. And uh, if we go on the dissection more, uh, we can see, and if we go to the posterior, we can observe some part of the middle cerebral peduncle fibers and uh, some part of the inferior cerebral peduncle fibers that present between the superior cerebral uh, peduncle and middle cerebral peduncle, and it passes to the other side over the nodule level to the uh, other side of the cerebellum. And uh, we can see the, uh, we can observe the uh, dentatinic use. Uh, if we follow the superior cerebral peduncle, we can observe the dentatinic use easily. And if we go on dissection to the posteriorly and the big, bigger appearance, we can see the superior cerebral peduncle and the, between the inferior and superior cerebral peduncle, middle cerebral peduncle, we can see the inferior cerebral peduncle. Some part of the inferior cerebral peduncle passes uh, the same side and some part of this crossing to the other side. And if we, if we remove the old uh, white matter, uh, and uh, uh, we can see observe the dentatinic use easily. Uh, it's very big, big use in the cerebellum. We can see the, in the operation with the microscope, and uh, sometimes it's mixing with the tumor because because it has a gray matter, and uh, uh, this uh, use has a connection with the dentate glutamic tract. It's passing inside the superior cerebral peduncle, and if we dissect more. And uh, remove the old, we can see the dentatinic use and the superior cerebral peduncle. Just lateral to the superior cerebral peduncle, we can see the inferior cerebral peduncle fibers that have been cut in here. And the lateral to this, there is a middle cerebral peduncle. And if we looking from laterally, we can see the uh, this is the colliculus, inferior colliculus, and this is the superior colliculus, and we can see the fourth nerve, and uh, this is the superior uh, cerebral peduncle fibers, and this is the inferior cerebral peduncle fibers that passing crossing over the superior cerebral peduncle, and lateral to this, there's a middle cerebral peduncle. If you follow the uh, superior cerebral peduncle fibers, we can reach to the biggest nucleus of the cerebellum. And if you look from lateral, we can see that the white uh, trigeminal, trigeminal nerve easily that's uh, arising between the uh, middle cerebral peduncle fibers. And uh, we observe that uh, superior to the uh, trigeminal nerve, these fibers are coming from up majorly from the cortical levels and the inferior to the, this trigeminal nerve, the major fibers are coming from the horns. And uh, this uh, is the trigeminal nerve. This is the lateral view. This is the inferior colliculus. And this is the uh, superior cerebral peduncle, and this is the colloculus. To uh, understand easily, and this is the another uh, lateral view of the cerebellum. We can see that uh, there is a, a lateral lanuscus, uh, just lateral to the superior cerebral peduncle, and we can observe the middle cerebral peduncle fibers. We cut the pons anteriorly. And we can see the some uh, pyramidal tract fibers and the middle cerebral peduncle fibers uh, in anterior part of the region. And if we go on the posterior and if we cut the uh, middle cerebral peduncle fibers, we can see the lay of the uh, trigeminal nerve. Uh, it's lying inside the middle cerebral peduncle. And we can reach the nucleus of the trigeminum in lateral side of the 
uh, Portman to do, uh, we can reach from the latter to the midline uh, dissection, uh, we can reach to the trigeminal nucleus. And if we cut, uh, put the dissector uh, to un under the lateral lemniscus, and uh, we can see better uh, the lateral lemniscus. This is the superior cerebral pedicle fibers, and this is the middle cerebral pedicle fibers. We can observe the fourth uh, nerve. It's um, passing uh, around the lateral lemniscus. And this is the suboccipital wheel. And anterior to the uh, inferior, uh, anterior, this is the pons level. And we can observe the uh, in suboccipital level tonsils and lateral to the tonsils. We can observe the biventral lobule. And uh, uh, if we look the midline, we can see the lingula pramic and the ula easily. And if we separate the tonsils and biventral lobules, we can see the biventral uh, tonsil, the biventral tissue. It's very important in the past it was this site is using for approach to the uh, fourth ventricle floor but right now televolar approach is more popular than this approach and uh, uh, if we separate the tonsils bilaterally we can see the inferior medullary volume and choroid plexus if we cut the volume and uh, remove the choroid plexus we can see the old ventricle floor and uh, till to uh, aqueduct, uh, we have to know that uh, from superior lateral uh, site is very important in tonsils because it's the attachment site to the cerebellum. And uh, if we go on dissection at the suboccipital surface, uh, at the primal level to the lateral to this, we can see the dental nucleus. So tonsil labiventral tissue approach always the mesh to the uh, then technicals, but if we approach from the uh, televolar, uh, we are not giving the damage to the neural tissue. And if we remove the tonsils bilaterally, we can see the uh, then technicals easily. And uh, there's in fourth ventricle uh, lateral side, we can see the then technicals protuberance. It can be landmark in approaches to the fourth ventricle or cerebellum. Uh, if we observe this uh, protuberance, we can understand that the uh, lateral to this side is the dental nucleus. And the medial to the, uh, we can observe the superior cerebral pedicle fibers. And if we go on dissection posteriorly, uh, we can observe the cerebellum bilaterally. We can see the superior cerebral pedicle fibers that's reaching to the dental nucleus, and the lateral there is vestibular uh, and dorsal cochlear nucleus. We can see that, and if we look from the inferior to the superior, we can observe the dental nucleus easily with the superior cerebral pedicle fibers. Just lateral to the there is uh, dental nucleus protuberance at the level of the lushka. And we can observe the vestibular nucleus in here and also coordinate nucleus at the lateral side. And we can see the uh, rhomboid fossa. And if we uh, separate the uh, uh, cerebellum from the vermin and uh, the tract to bilaterally, we can see all the fourth ventricle floor. And uh, there's a rhomboid fossa. And the, this is inferior fovea, superior fovea, uh, facial folliculus. And, uh, at the midline, median long distance can be seen. There is laterally superior vestibular nucleus and dorsal cochlear nucleus can be seen. And if by making dissection, of course, we are correcting the, the old dissections with the DTI. These are all DTI images. Uh, we made this paper approximately 10 years ago. So right now there's high resolution DTI images is better than this uh, images. And uh, we can observe the red color. Uh, red, I'm sorry, red color is inferior cerebral pedicle, and the uh, yellow color is middle cerebral pedicle fibers, and the yellow uh, green is uh, superior cerebral pedicle fibers. And this is our dissection correlated with this. And uh, if we look from laterally, and uh, again, the same appearance with the DTI images. 
and uh, we opened uh, our uh, Roton lab while uh, in uh, 2014 and uh, with opening of the uh, we, we opened the, our lab with the Dr. Roton slide and uh, we uh, and we made a lot of paper in our lab. Uh, uh, we learned the many things from Dr. Roton and uh, uh, the lab was built uh, while Dr. Roton was uh, alive and it was opened by Dr. Roton. And uh, Dr. Oliveira, Matsushima, and Mekti, and Matthiasen and gave lecture in this uh, cadaver uh, lab and uh, Roton Dr. Roton is uh, one of my life uh, turning points. I got ideas and advice from him and uh, he helped me too much in my uh, social life and academic life. And hundreds of people all over the world all are currently on his way and uh, leave his uh, memory. And when uh, COVID epidemic is over, I would like to thank all of you friends and teachers uh, who contribute to the holding this meeting and we talk uh, of being together again and uh, as the uh, in old days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Akakin. Thanks for that beautiful presentation. Um, let me check if we have any questions. Okay, this is actually, uh, someone is asking, um, in my experience, because this is for me apparently, while resecting tumor, how much hippocampal and insular damage has no neurodeficit? I think that's also a great question for Dr. Ture that he, he can address now or later. Um, uh, what happens when you remove the hippocampus and the insula? Uh, in my experience in general, when patients have already a tumor in the hippocampus or in the insula, they actually can get better and get better. Also, Juan, if you're around, if you're going to address the post-operative deficit in patients with uh, insular gliomas, I know you have a good experience with insular gliomas, um, uh, what type of deficits could you expect uh, post-operatively? We can, let's, let's leave this question for later uh, and Dr. Tude can address and, and respond to us. Uh, so next we have with us um, Dr. Olanda, Vanessa. Um, welcome, Vanessa. She's, she's also a Rotten uh, Fellow, uh, one of the last fellows with Professor Rotten, and also a, a trainee of Dr. Evandro Oliveira, and also, I believe, working in the lab with uh, Evandro. Uh, yeah. Welcome, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Juan. Um... I'm very grateful to be here. I'm very grateful to you and uh, Abuzer to organizing this, this session and for keeping um, this, the society alive. So um, I'm going to talk to you uh, this morning. Now here in Brazil, it's very early in the morning, but uh, I know that we have people from all over the world here. And I, 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 you are more than welcome to um, ask questions in the Q&A um, portion. And if I don't have time to answer during, uh, after the presentation, I can answer, I can answer, I can type the, the, the answer. So uh, I'm going to share with you the microsurgical anatomy of the central core. Um, first things first, let's start with the definition of this area. Okay, what, what is the central core? And for that, I really, I highly recommend this article uh, by Dr. Hibas, uh, a dear friend. And um, he, he, he wrote this, this definition that I'm going to, to show you. So the central core is stand as a block on the, so and gets in and the and it, it's it gets the surface of the insula as you can see here and then the stream capsule 
the claustrum, the external capsule, the putamen, the globus pallidus, externus and inter internus, the internal capsule, so the anterior limb and then posterior limb of the internal capsule, the caudate nucleus, the um, stria terminalis and the thalamus, okay? And also a portion of the uh, septal region. But also um, we have the, this area, uh, right superior and posterior to the anterior uh, perforate substance. And we have also a portion of the uh, accumbens, of the nucleus accumbens, substantia nominata, and also uh, the medial portion of the, um, of the anterior commissure, okay? is also uh, a part of the, the central cord. So now that we know the definition, it's very important to understand how these areas um, are connected to the brain and also um, some connections between them. So here in this lateral view, I've removed a portion of the frontal lobe. We can see the, the right side and uh, we are going deeper and, and, and these, these deep structures, they are still connected to the left side. So in here, you can see that the putamen is continuing here with the substantia nominata, okay? And then uh, you have here putamen and substantia nominata. We don't have a clear uh, uh, separation between them. And also we have here the caudate nucleus continuing with the accumbens, okay? And here in this anterior, in anterior view, we have here accumbens, continuing with the caudate nucleus. And laterally, we have the substantia nominata continuing with the putamen. Um, I don't know if you can see here, but a portion of the anterior uh, limb of the internal capsule, we can see separating the uh, substantia nominata and accumbens, and also caudate nucleus and putamen. Uh, it's not uh, we, we don't have so many fibers here in the basal portion, but um, you can still see uh, these fibers and they are very important fibers when we are thinking because here we are in the, in the session talking about complex surgeries and um, my field is functional neurosurgery. So these fibers, they are very important when we are treating um, obsessive compulsive disorders, OCD. So we are simulating the posterior portion of these fibers, right anterior to the anterior commissure, and also um, portion of their accumbens. okay? So um, let's, let's go uh, deeper from the surface and, and understand where exactly is the, um, the central core layer by layer. And this dissection was performed by um, Seha uh, Baidin, Dr. Seha Baidin. Uh, I've been working with him and, and Dr. Abuzer Gungor um, in these uh, dissections, but this one he, he performed. And then um, I'm going, it's the, the next five slides as well. Okay. So um, here in this lateral view, we have the surface of the insula as I showed show you uh, from that superior view before. And then um, once we remove those um, cortical, cortical portion of the insula, we have the stream capsule, okay? And then um, these, these, uh, these areas, well, once we remove this stream cup, so we have the claustrum and also uh, we have the external capsule, okay? And then when we go deeply, we have the putamen here, okay? And then um, this, this ventral portion of the stream capsule is formed by the... Uh, the uncinate fasciculus ventrally, and also the inferior occipital fasciculus dorsally. And then uh, when we go deeper, we have GPE, or globus pallidus externus, and also we can see uh, 
these deep arteries. And I, I really like this uh, dissection. Uh, Dr. Seha did a great uh, dissection here. So here we have the lenticular straight, straight arteries. All right. So, and, and you can see all these, these dissections in this article that I, I really recommend you to read to understand better this neuroanatomy. So um, now I want to invite you to a deep understanding of these, of some of the deep structures of the, um, the central core, because uh, once we, uh, and, and last night, Dr. Carolina Martins was talking about that when, uh, when he, he, she was presenting uh, at the Dr. Evandro's um, legacy and also mastering in, in, in neurosurgery. She was talking about the mindset that we have. And all, all of us, former fellows of Dr. Rotten, uh, he was always teaching us to keep working and also to uh, every day to perform better uh, what, than what we did uh, at, uh, on the day before. So um, that's why I, I went to the lab. That's why I, 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 I tried to learn even more about these structures, mainly the globus pallidus and also the thalamus, okay? I also study other structures, but because here we are talking about the central core, I want to um, get you to, to, to go deeper in these structures, okay? So, um, and these structures are also important for uh, tumor surgeries, okay? We have many, many surgeries that we, we need. Uh, we just had a question about the insular tumors so it's very important to understand deeper this uh, neuroanatomy so we can uh, even understand and even, even um, answer the, the question that we just, we just had uh, to understand what is going to happen to the patient once we get to that structure that we move that portion of the brain. Okay, so first the GPI, the globus pallidus internus, here we have anterior view and then um, we have for for you to to localize. You have to be. You you can see here the optic tract both sides, okay. And then right superior to the optic tract, we have GPI here both sides. And you can still see some of the structures here that I showed you in the lateral view, and and also anterior. You can see here accumbens and laterally. Substantia nominata continuing with the putamen. Okay, here, portion of the surface of the insula. Here, also the surface of the insula. And then you can, you can see the, you can have a better 3D understanding that X-ray view that Dr. Rotten, uh, Dr. Rotten used to say to understand better these deep structures. And here in this lateral view, you can see the optic tract and right superior to the optic tract and the optic tract in, in the functional neurosurgery field. And of course, in, in many surgeries um, that we need to, to work with the globus pallidus, it's a very important landmark in surgery. So in mainly in functional, functional neurosurgery, we can even hear the firing when we are using the M MER. Uh, we can hear the firing of the, the neuron, neurons in this area once we get closer to, to this tract. And then we can, um, we can know that we are in the correct position uh, to implant the lead, okay? And here, uh, inferiorly, we have the sub subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra here. And then here in this inferior view, we have GPI, both sides here. And you can see a, a very uh, uh, quite clear connection here between the GPI and the STN. I'm going to show you a little bit more about the connections. And, and you also can see how important it is to see, to really see the structure, mainly in functional surgery. I mean, in, in all the surgeries that we are going for, we need to see what we're going through step by step. Um, 
even before surgery. And then here we have uh, GPI and GPE in this, in, it's a, a special sequence. In, in MRI that we call F Gator. It was, this, this sequence was, um, was made in Gainesville, okay, or where Dr. Rotten's lab um, was. And then uh, it's very important to see, and that's why they call F Gator, it's, it's called F Gator because of the Gators that they have there, uh, the, the football team in Gainesville. Okay, so and then we can even we can see very clear here the lamina between the GPI and the GP. So and here we have these connections. Okay, we have the thalamus, the connection, and these are beautiful uh, drawings made uh, made by um, Robin, dear Robin. And then uh, here we have the connections between the 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 GPI with the STN and also the thalamus, substantia nigra, PPN, and GPE, and STN, and amygdala, and putamen. Okay, we could uh, have one meeting just to talk about these, uh, these structures and these connections, but then you, you can start to see um, maybe why it's called the central core, because it's, it's uh, these, and I'm, I'm just showing you here the GPI, but you can understand that uh, even the thalamus that I'm going, to, I'm going to show you later, it's connected to many areas of the brain. Okay, and I'm just showing you here uh, what I got to dissect. We also, I, I'm also going to show you more uh, detail. So, and here I, I, I really recommend you to to read this article also that I, I was honored. It was just published last month. Um, I was honored to work with Dr. Eric Middlebrooks. That he was, um, he's a, a neuroradiologist now working at Mayo Clinic, but uh, he used to work with Dr. Rotten. We, we all had uh, Dr. Abuzer Gungo also work with him and, and, and he, he performed his, right now as Dr. Akin um, was saying, we have, it's the, the narrow image is evolving. And, and with that, we are, we're getting to see better the tracks. And he, the, here is a seven Tesla MRI, and we can see the connections between the GPI and the STN here. Okay, and also the fibers, the connection between the GPI and the thalamus. Okay, so two structures there in the central core, they are connected. And, and these connections here, this uh, red, uh, yellow connections here, they are, they are going to, they are the, the pallidotalamic, they are portion of the, the foral, um, foral portion of the, fi of the fibers. And these are fibers that we are uh, stimulating when we are, uh, when we put a lead here in the VIM, the anterior portion of the VIM, so we can get better the tremor for the, the patients, for example. And also these fibers that I'm going to show you later that are coming from the uh, dentate, um, the, the dentate, dentate nucleus um, in the cerebellum. So the, the, the nucleus that Dr. Akin just showed you, it's connected to the thalamus, okay? So, and then let's just go step by step to see what we have uh, when we, we have this lead in the brain. This was the, my main uh, work at the Dr. Rotten's lab. And we, we cross the superior frontal gyros and then U fibers. And then um, we have, we are going deeper and then we have corona radiata and then putamen and then GPE, GPI and the optic tract deep there. Okay, so and then um, I, I mentioned that we have uh, those connections to GPI. So, and why is that important? What is that helping us uh, in the surgeries? So we performed uh, also this work and we did a segmentation of the globus pallidus and we got the, the patients um, we, we use the UPDRS, that is the scale that we use 
to measure how patient got better. And we have all these areas, all these structures connected to the GPI. And you can see how this structure in the, the central core is important for uh, it's connected in the brain. So, and the patients who got better, uh, got a better improvement in the UPDRS was the, the, the patients who had the lead uh, into the, the supple supplementary motor area and premotor cortex, okay? And uh, you can see many of these um, dissections that I showed you in this paper that just come, came out uh, in, in neurosurgery in June this year, that it's my, um, my main work over there with, uh, at the doc Dr. Rotten's lab. And also Dr. Abuzer Gunger is here. Uh, he helped a lot in this, in this work. So, and for the thalamus, just uh, some points. And wh when we go deeper in the thalamus, we can see um, many nucleus, important nucleus. And we have uh, VIM that we use when we, we are simulating for tremor. Here we have the complex, um, the central med median uh, parafascicular complex that we simulate for uh, two rats, epilepsy. And here, those connections that I mentioned. Here we have dentate nucleus, both sides, the cerebellum that Dr. Akin just showed. And then we have the fibers going up here, the, denta, the dentato rubrothalamic, that's here, the, the, the nucleus rubrus. And then we have the red nucleus. And then we have going. Uh, superiorly, we have VIM both sides, okay? And here we also have this, this is also, um, uh, it was, it's, it's also in that paper uh, that just came out last month. And then we have here the fibers. Some of them, they, they are going to go, coming from the, the, the dentate nucleus, they are going to cross. And some of them, they are going to come from the same, uh, same uh, hemisphere, okay? And this, in this medial view, we have the medial lemniscus coming up. And here we have VC, that's the ventral caudalis in the thalamus. So it's very important, a very important landmark and it's related to sensory. And again, the, the complex. And we perform the same thing for the essential tremor patients. And we also uh, discovered that they had the TRS scale, it's the tremor rating scale, uh, they got 75% better when we, uh, we got to stimulate the supplementary motor area and also the uh, permotor cortex in those patients, okay? Um, I'm, I really, I highly recommend this book that just came out uh, last month. Uh, it's a deep brain stimulation book uh, with Dr. Uh, Dr. Michael Ockham, that's the, the the, the head of neurology uh, at the University of Florida. And I was very honored to have uh, one of the pictures that I just showed you here in the cover. Okay. So I'm, I'm very, I, I want to thank all, all of you that is here. Uh, like see, I, I would love to be in person, but uh, at least we can uh, see each other and, and still have a connection and keep this, this Rotten Society alive. This was, it's kind of con continuation of the, this last day here in the lab. Okay, so it was a very sad, it was June 23rd in 2017. And here with Robin, Alice and Laura. So I'm very grateful to all of them. And I'm very grateful to all of you to keeping, uh, for keeping this um, society alive. And here is my team. I'm very grateful to Dr. Evandro, who invited me to help in the lab, to coordinate the lab with Dr. Mateus. And he is one in one of our courses in, in the lab. And we still have uh, fellows coming. And even now, in, during the pandemic time, we have uh, three fellows here from Libya, from Cuba, Cuba and working and keeping keep working in this, in this field. And, and keeping the, what Dr. Rotten uh, told us, because uh, he, he, always, he was always saying, I, I want you to be teachers. And that's, that's what uh, we are doing here. We are sharing what we, are, we learned from, from him and what we are 
we are learn we are, we are still learning as for the fellow full hard and we promise to to do that um, for the rest of our lives okay so i'm i'm with that i want to finish thank you thanks vanessa thanks so much for your lecture really enjoyed those are amazing beautiful pictures mm -hmm. and dissections so intricate to understand that central core and uh uh, we might see some study from Ur later on the central core. Let's see. Um, beautiful work. So next we have Max, Maximiliano Nunez mm -hmm. from Argentina, who is a, a dear friend to many of us. Yeah. Uh, he's not only an amazing anatomist with the most spectacular fiber track brainstem dissection I've ever seen, or dissections to any extent of anywhere in the you know, it's absolutely spectacular, but also a, a wonderful person. Um, and he's going to come with us to Stanford soon. We're looking forward to have you around. Um, he worked with Professor Rotten. Actually, he was his last fellow. Um, and then after that, he came to uh, Pittsburgh when I was there and did some work in my lab, some work, excellent work in dissecting. That's where he showed me the fiber track dissection of the brain that I've never seen before. So. Um, and I was uh, thrilled by that. So Max, please go ahead. I think he's gonna talk about the intrinsic beauty of the brainstem fiber tracks, because indeed they are beautiful. Thank you, Professor. I want to share my, my screen. You have some echo, Max, I think. Let's let's check on that. Now, I good. think it's very good. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. OK. Thank you, Professor, for this opportunity. It's, uh, it's my honor to be part of this meeting. Uh, it's a really honor to be part of this, this meeting. I want to show you, in this, in this case, uh, the beauty of the brainstem fibers. The, the intrinsic anatomy of the brainstem fiber track. Obviously, I want I, I want to show every track in, in the brainstem, but I, I think it's impossible. But I will try to to show you uh, the most important structures in the brainstem. Uh, as you see, this is the anterior full view of the of the brainstem. We can divide the brainstem in three parts the superior part of mesencephalic portion, the central part of the bones, and in the inferior part, the medulla oblongata. Obviously, the most important fibers in the ventral portion, in my opinion, to preserve is the corticospinal fiber tract, like everybody know. The corticospinal fiber tract is a very important, not just landmark, obviously, is a very important functional pathway. For this reason, I want to share with all of the, all of you one picture like this. We totally dissected the track from the cortex to downward to reach the inferior portion of the medulla oblongata. This is the corticospinal fiber track. This is the full view of the brainstem, totally dissected. This is a beauty and perfect anatomy, in my opinion. Just to understand the anatomy of the midbrain, I will try to dissect some parts, the most important fiber track and nuclear complex inside in the midbrain. In this picture, I want to show you the most important structure at the level of the midbrain. Obviously, the cerebral peduncle is the most important structure here. The other landmarks is the or the apparent origin of the third nerve, inner in the interpeduncular force. But again, the most important structure here is the cerebral peduncle. The cerebral peduncle we can divide in three portions: the most internal group of fibers, the central portion of the cerebral peduncle, and the most lateral fibers of the cerebral peduncle. 
what is the most important and critical area? This, the central portion, because here we find the corticobulbar, corticospinal, and corticonuclear fiber tract. Remember this point. What happens if you dissect the central of the cerebral pedunculum? Of course, you can reach and find some group, some group of nuclear structures. Like in this case, you can see here the substantia nigra hidden inside in the center of the cerebral pedunculum. If you dissect the opposite cerebral pedunculum, you see again here the substantia nigra. But over the substantia nigra, like a crown, you can find here the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. Everybody knows this anatomy. This anatomy is very important. And this is the very good landmark to understand the position of the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. What happens if you make a gentle dissection? Again, if you continue with the dissection, you can reach many structures inside in the interpeduncular force. This is a very nice view of the interpeduncular area just to understand the position here of the substantia nigra. Again, the apparent origin of the third nerve is very important landmark here and over the substantia nigra here, the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. I remove the medial portion of the cerebral pedunculum just to understand the position of this structure, the red nucleus. Obviously, if you see the lower portion of this area, you can reach the interpeduncular nucleus and retroflexo fasciculus of Maynard, one side and the opposite side. These fasciculus coming from the back at the level of the avenular area to reach this interpeduncular nucleus. This is the full view and the beautiful anatomy just to understand the complexity of the brainstem. I dissect some parts in the center of the cerebral pedunculum and in the center of the fibers coming from top to down at the level of the pons. Obviously, here the interpeduncular fossa is the very, very important area to understand because some approaches to this area inside in some safe entry point is a critical uh, is, a, is is critical to understand when you project your surgery. Now I want to describe fibers of the lateral surface of the midbrain. This is the very nice and very important area of the brainstem. The lateral surface of the brainstem is one of the most important areas to understand the position of the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. The lateral mesencephalic sulcus is a good landmark to understand the approach to the midbrain. The lateral mesencephalic sulcus is in this position, is here. You can see this point is the, it's like a triangle. The limit of this area is the inferior conjunctival branch, the lateral lemniscus in the back, and here the cerebral pedunculum in the inferior and anterior limit. This area is critical to understand the disposition of the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. Also, you can see here the four nerve, the superior cerebral pedunculum, the interpeduncular sulcus, here the medial cerebral pedunculum, and in the back here the dentate nucleus, the most important nucleus inside in the <clears throat> uh, cerebellum like Professor Akin showed before. This is a closer view, a very nice close view of the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. Everybody know these structures are very critical and very important to understand the disposition, again, the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. Also, we can see the pineal region and the quadrigeminal plate, superior colliculus, inferior colliculus, inferior conjunctival branch running to reach here, this point, and the posterior limit is the lateral lemniscus, and the more ventral and inferior limit is the cerebral pedunculum. Now I want to describe the fibers of the posterior face of the brainstem. The posterior surface of the brainstem is a very nice uh, area and the most important area, of course, is the quadrigeminal plate. The quadrigeminal plate is this, like everybody knows, and the pineal region is very close to this area. 
the most important structure here is the superior colliculus, one side, opposite side, inferior colliculus, obviously, here, the frenulum belly, this is the attachment to the superior velo medullar. Of course, here below the inferior colliculus, the four nerve, again, the four nerve. And in the lateral position, these fibers are the lateral lemniscus coming from down to reach the inferior colliculus. Of course, in the central position here, the this is the superior cerebellar pedancle. The superior cerebral pedancle limits with the medial cerebral pedancle by the intermedial sulcus or interpeduncular sulcus. In the roof of the four ventricles here, between both nucleus here, we find this group of nucleus. This is the, these nucleus are the roof, the nucleus of the root, the roof of the four ventricles, globoso, emboliforme, and fastigial nucleus. Now I will, I will try to show you some fibers of the most important fibers of the bones. The bones is a very nice structure and very complex structure too, but this is the way like everybody knows the bones. In my opinion, the bones is very, very complex, but it's a more bigger part of the brainstem. We can divide in superficial layers, transversal fibers, uh, the more superficial layer, we can divide in the medial aspect of the, of the pons by the one in a, a intermedial layer, transversal layer, and more deep in the, in the more deep layer, they are stratum profundum. To dissect the pons, you must be very, very gentle. And uh, in that way, you can reach the dissection. This is the surface of the pons, just to understand this is the more superficial transversal fibers here, here, and here. And if you dissect some of these transversal fibers, you can reach the corticospinal fiber tract. You see the disposition is no rect. It's like a twin. The corticospinal fiber tract coming from top to down and make a curve in the direction to reach the decusation at the level of the medulla oblongata. Another critical area is the peritrigeminal area. Everybody knows this area is very useful to reach this aspect of the pons. Here, the motor root and the sensorial root of the trigeminal nerve. I want to show you now, if you dissect the more superficial layer of the pons, you can reach the stratum complexum. The stratum complexum of the brainstem in, in, in this part, in the pons, is the more medial transversal fiber. They connect one side to the opposite side of the cerebellum. In the central position, the trapezoidal body, this body, this group of, 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 of fibers cross the medial line and they uh, be part of the acoustic system. Over the trapezoidal body, we can find here the central nucleus of the pons. This is very important a group of cellular uh, structure because the this structure is a relationship with the uh, movement of the ACE when you sleep. Now, if you want to see the medial aspect of the brainstem at the level of the pons, you must be dissect the medial phase. Here, the superficial layers, the superficial fibers of the pons. Here, the corticospinal fiber tract coming from top to down. You can see the intrinsic anatomy for the medial phase. Here is the more compact component of the pons. Here the intermediate layers of the end or, 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 or we, we can call uh, a complexum uh, layer. In the back, here the most, the most uh, important fibers here is the medial lemniscus. The medial lemniscus is who divide the pons in ventral portion and dorsal portion. This is the ventral portion of the pons and this is the dorsal portion, portion of the pons. Of course, these structures are very important to understand when you planning arrive, arrive uh, to the pons. If you dissect step by step the pons from ventral to dorsal, 
the most important structure you can find in the first time is these fibers. This, they are the, the, the transversal fibers, the stratum profundum. Again, this stratum connect one side with the opposite side of the cerebellum. In the lower part of the picture, in the opposite direction, you can find these uh, vertical fibers. These fibers are the medial lemniscus coming from down to upward to reach in this way the ventrapostral lateral nucleus of the thalamus, like everybody know. Now I remove some part of that fiber to understand the position of the medial longitudinal fasciculum here running in the deep inside in the four ventricular floor. Next to it here, the tectospinal tract, they connect the tectum with the inferior olive. And now I preserve the most important fibers here is the medial lemniscus, like I said before, and next to it here, the most deep transversal fibers of the pons. Now I want to remove these fibers to understand of the new tracks. Again, medial longitudinal fasciculum, next to it, tectos, tectospinal tract, close to the tectospinal tract, a little bit more anteriorly here, <clears throat> ventral, in, in ventral position, this is the central tegmental tract. Next to the central tegmental tract, in obliquid position, the mesencephalic nucleus of the five nerve. And of course, here, the nucleus ceruleus. Everybody knows nucleus ceruleus, the more important uh, group of cellular with noradrenaline concentration in the floor of the I remove some tracts and preserve the mesencephalic nucleus of the five and nucleus ceruleus just to understand the disposition of this structure. Everybody see this structure. This is the anterior view of the superior cerebral peduncle. Of course, here, the lateral recess. Now, this is the full view, the totally full view in the big window. I made a big window to understand the complexity of this dissection to see, like I, I want to show you now in the closer view, the decusation of the superior cerebral peduncle from a ventral view. The cerebral peduncle, in this case, the superior cerebral peduncle make the decusation under the inferior uh, colliculus at the level of the midbrain, like everybody knows. But this view is a little bit different because you can see from ventral vision. Here, again, in the center of the superior cerebral peduncle, so here, the nucleus ceruleus. If you follow these fibers, you can see how rich this area. This is the junction between the midbrain and the pons. Now, we continue with the dissection at the level of the bulbomedular portion. This is the critical area. I listened to Professor Touré in one uh, talk, uh, uh, talking about this area. And like, I, like he say, is a very, very important area. It's totally different if you compare with the pons with the midbrain. It's a critical and a very little area. It's very important uh, to know. If you dissect this area, you must be concentrate your vision in this aspect of the brainstem, the more lower part. The most important landmark and nuclear structure here and tracks are this. Here we see the pyramid. The pyramid is the continuation, of course, of the <coughs> corticospinal tract under to reach this point, the decusation of the corticospinal tract. Obviously, next to it, you have here the olive and the preolivar and postolivar sulcus. Behind of the postolivar sulcus, the inferior cerebral peduncle. But in the left side of this picture, I make a cut here and I make a cut here to take off this part and discover in this way these vertical fibers. What type of fibers are these? Obviously, this is the medial lemniscus fibers coming from down to upward to reach at the level of the thalamus, the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Remember you, I told you before, the shape of the medial lemniscus is like a C with the concavity at the level of the pons to ventral. This is a very, very important landmark because divided 
the, 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 the pontine area in one ventral and dorsal portion. This is the closer view just to understand the position of the leaf, the preolivar sulcus, retrolivar sulcus, and posteriorly, the inferior cerebral pedancle. Obviously, if you cut here and cut here, you can understand the disposition of the fibers of the medial lens. Now, in the lateral view, the most important uh, fiber struck here are in the retrolivar sulcus. But the preolivar sulcus is very dangerous because it's very close with the pyramid here. This is the leaf, and these fibers around it, it, the name is the amiculum of the olive. They run around of the olive. Behind of the olive, we see here the retrolivar sulcus. The most important track here, obviously, is here uh, the spinothalamic track and a little bit more deep rubrospinal fiber track. Obviously, in the dorsal aspect of this picture, we can find here the inferior cerebral peduncle. You must be take careful at this level because it's very close with the corticospinal fiber structure. To finish my exposition, I want to tell you some words about the four ventricles. This is a critical area, and for me, it's one of the most beautiful areas to dissect. The four ventricle is like a rhomboidal shape, shape, sorry, but we have three parts. The first one is the superior triangle at the level of the pons. In the center of the imaging here is the junction, uh, is the junction portion, and in the inferior part of this slide is the inferior triangle at the level of the medulla oblongata. This is like everybody knows the four ventricles. The most important and critical landmark is the facial colliculus in the floor of the four ventricles. Everybody knows we have a suprafacial approach, infrafacial approach, and for the middle line, some problems we can, we can, we can take in the, at the level of the middle line because here, hidden inside in the floor, run the medial longitudinal fascicle. They connect the fiber of this tract, connect the nucleus of the six, four and third nerve. But if you dissect the four of the four ventricle, you need to remove the dorsal aspect of the brainstem. You need to remove these structures. To remove this structure, I prefer remove first the, the left side to understand what you see if you remove this. Obviously, if you do that, you can understand the disposition in this picture of the facial colliculus. Here, the facial colliculus, the nucleus of the six, the nucleus of the seven, and the inferior vertical and superior portion of the seven nerve. Of course, here, I, rem I remember, I tell you before, this is <clears throat> the dentate nucleus. But what happens if you remove this area? Okay, I remove this portion and I not dissect the right side, just to compare with the left side. The floor of the four ventricle we can divide for the medial sulcus and for the limitant sulcus in the side next to the superior cerebral peduncle. Remember, the superior cerebral peduncle and the inferior cerebral peduncle both are the limits of the four ventricle, never the, the medial cerebral peduncle. The most important structure, like I tell you before, is the facial colliculus. Also in the inferior triangle, we find very critical structures like a tectospinal tract, central tegmental tract, and inside in the interior of the inferior peduncle, here the nucleus ambiguous, and here the, 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 the trigeminospinal fiber tract. But the most important structure here at the level of the calamus scriptorius is the <clears throat> triangles of the 12th nerve and triangle of the 10th, hypoglossal and vagal triangle. I dissect the right side to see in this way the strias, the acoustic strias here running from the lateral to medial in the medial aspect of the four ventricular floor. 
just to understand the disposition of this area, I dissect a little more gentle and uh, I dissect some nucleus here in the floor of the four ventricle. In the four ventricle is like I said before, a critical area and uh, over the, the hypoglossal and vagal nucleus, we find some group of critical areas like a perihypoglossal nucleus, like a nucleus of roller and nucleus um, prepositus. In the middle, intercalatus nucleus, but in this case, I can dissect. Again, here, detector spinal tract, central tegmental tract, here, nucleus ambiguous, and here, the spinal, the, uh, um, um, the, the trigeminal, um, the trigeminal spinal tract. Sorry, here I remove some acoustic part just to understand this tract. This is the nucleus and tract of fasciculus solitarius inside in the deep of the forventricle. To finish, this fiber coming from the this. Uh, tubercular gracilis and cuneatus. I remove these superficial layers just to discover these fibers coming from this cuneatus and gracilis nucleus and reach in the ventral portion of at, at the level of the ovex, anterior to the ovex, eh? anterior to the gray matter at the level of the medulla oblongata and behind of the pyramid, these fibers cross the middle line to reach the opposite side and in that way, running to upward to reach like a medial lemniscus, the thalamus at the level of the, of, the, of the nucleus of the thalamus, like I said before. Just one minute, and I want to show you some picture, and I want to say some words about the most important person, I think, in my career and in my life. The first one, Everybody knows Professor Evandro. He was a great mentor for me. Uh, he, he made my recommendation later for, for reach the Rotten Lab. Uh, and I was with him in Sao Paulo in the, in the lab with these uh, partners. I have the best memory about all of them. And I want to say thank you, Dr. Evandro. Thank you for your support. Thank you uh, for, for, for your help. And I want to say and send my best regard for you. This is a very important picture. This is my grandfather and my father. There was a neurosurgeon too. And I miss both. Obviously, this is the funny picture of my, my mentor. He's Pablo Rubino, everybody know him. And this funny picture was taken a few days ago in one trial with him. Uh, he stopped in the in the middle of the road and say, Max, I want to I want to eat. Uh, this is the typical uh, food of my country. Uh, the name is choripan, and uh, Professor Evandro loved this 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 food. It was very very funny. Pablo was my mentor. He's still my mentor. But in this moment, I I I think I am sure I can call him my friend. Thank you, Pablo, for your support for all this year to teach me. Obviously, some words about this great woman. Robin, thank you very much. You was like my mother in Gainesville. I love you. Thank you, thank you very much. And this man don't need presentation. Thank you, Professor Evandro, for giving me the opportunity to, to, to be in your lab. I never, I can never know him because the same day when I arrived to Gainesville, Professor Rotton died. That was a very bad and very sad time for me. This is the reason why I was alone in, in the lab, but in another hand was an extraordinary experience for me. And to finish, this is my, my partner, this picture in UPMC Pittsburgh, when I was a fellow of this special man. Uh, for me, I, I, sometimes I, I, I can't find some words to describe what I, I, I feel or I think about this man. Probably he changed my, the, my career. Uh, he gave me one opportunity to accept him in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, after that, uh, he gave me the one of the, the best opportunity in my life to show my work in, in Chicago in 2016. I remember, I, I can't forget that. 
she trusted me in that time. And now in, in, in this part of my life, Professor Fernandez Miranda gave me a new opportunity, a new step in my life. It's a, it's, it's a challenger for me. He gave me the opportunity to, to, to reach and continue learning from him in Stanford. It's amazing for me to think about that. I, 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 don't, I don't know how can I say thank you, but... I, I am the one learning from you, Max, like many of us here listening to this lecture on the brainstem. You know, I've never seen such a beautiful lecture and I, I, I was here with the lights off and yes, uh, you know, resting while I was seeing the presentation. I wish we could do it in 3D. And actually we talk about doing some of these presentations in 3D, but yes. it's quite complicated, uh, you know, with the computer, but it, it's, uh, it's just some food for thought. Um, some of the participants might think of a way to do it um, that is that is uh, easy um, and affordable, but it, it, I really enjoy your presentation, Max. Thank you, Professor. Thank you again. And thank you for trusting me again. I, I hope in my heart, see you again uh, soon. Thank you for this opportunity, and saying and thank you all of the uh, of the committee for the, for this opportunity for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Beautiful work. Um, so it's not easy to follow Max with that great lecture. Um, because that uh, brainstem dissection is just a uh, unique and the way to understand it. But we have team with us. Team is uh, come from France and uh, he also spent time with me while I was in Pittsburgh. And I was very impressed with his great work on fiber tracking and reconstruction of the brainstem and cranial nerves with fiber tracking. Uh, something that I've tried and I, you know, I, I couldn't do and he, he does so well. And um, it's another example of how we all learn from uh, from each other. I, I learned from the fellows and Dr. Rodman used to say this all the time, how he learned from, he learned from the fellows and that's what he did and that's what I tried to do too, learn from you guys. And as we said, this meeting is not just about showing uh, master surgeries, which is a lot about that, but it's also about giving the chance to young people like you guys that are doing phenomenal work. Um, and you will probably be inspiring some of the participants today to uh, follow your steps. So team, welcome, and the screen is yours. Hi, 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 Juan. Do you, do you hear me good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, well, I can share the screen, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, hi, everybody, hi, Juan. It's so good to, to hear you. It's so good to see this phenomenal dissections. And uh, yeah, I'm very honored to be part of this uh, meeting. And it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a great honor to, to, to speak to you today. So can you, do, can you see my screen, right? Everything is good? Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I, uh, I have this talk, but I, I just wanted to thank you firstly, because I have the opportunity to be with you in Pittsburgh and then a little bit in Stanford. And it was a very great time. And uh, I'm the, the, the little guy at the upper right corner. And uh, <laughs> it's so fun to see me in, a, in, the, in this picture. But thank you very much because I can feel the, the kindness. And uh, I, I'm very honored and very pleased to, to be a part of this great family of anatomy. And I, I keep working. And I'm very honored to speak uh, of my work and try to uh, to give the, the, the enthusiasm of working about anatomy, of learning more and more about neurosurgical anatomy and, and try to apply it uh, to the OR, right? That the, the philosophy of uh, all of us today. So just a little, little bit talk about uh, cranial nerve tracking and the interest of, of this tractography uh, for pre-surgical planning, uh, of particularly of, for, for skull-based tumor surgery. And uh, I just wanted to talk to you today about my PhD project. And it, well, it was all about cranial nerve tracking. And uh, I wanted to present the different step of uh, the, the PhD project, if you don't mind. So skull-based tumor, 
uh, that's not a, a new challenge. That's a very old challenge. And as you can see in this picture of uh, Andreas Vesalius, it was in 1543. And he drew this, like, uh, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> like a huge, huge skull based tumor. And uh, he, uh, all, he, at this time, he, he, he was already a challenge. So, skull based is a challenge. It's an anatomical challenge because of the rich anatomical environment, a lot of vessels, a lot of crown and nerve, as you know, and it put a trace the surgery. So, we have classical uh, imaging, but as you can see in, the, in this picture, the classical MRI can't uh, divide the cranial nerves and their pos position in the context of complex skull-based tumor. As you can see, uh, maybe I put, put my, yeah, my pointer. As you can see on the, on the right side, the, the acoustic fascial bundle is well seen in, in the normal condition, in healthy conditions. But when you have a tumor, you, you can't see the, the, the cranial nerves. Uh, they are, you know, displaced, uh, flattened uh, around the tumor. And in all the case of like a epidermal cyst, you, you can't see the tumor. You, you have a lot of, you know, changes uh, due to the tumor growing and that's very, very hard. And uh, when you love anatomy, uh, when you are involved in anatomy, you want to do a, a very a a thorough, Preoperative planning, and you want to anticipate the position of cranial nerves. So that that's the point, and we you we can't do this actually. So advances in imaging have brought a new tool that is tractography. And what is that? It's just a, a tool uh, from the diffusion MRI, and it, it can uh, the tractography is a pipeline, is a process uh, from the diffusion MRI because the the diffusion MRI can detect movement of water molecule along fibers in the biological tissues. And then if you apply a mathematical algorithm, you can reconstruct step by step the trajectory of fibers. That's the, the general principle. And uh, for if you want to do that, you need to put a region of interest within a working space, and then you apply the algorithm. And the algorithm can be either deterministic or probabilistic. Deterministic, it, it gives you a trajectory of fibers because you will find uh, voxel to voxel uh, the, the, the most uh, similar orientation of the water molecule along fibers. And probabilistic, you will just apply the algorithm and search the most probable uh, trajectory of fibers. That's two different uh, ways to do that. But the problem of tractography is the resolution either spatial and angular. Spatial resolution, because of the diffusion MRI, most of the time, the, the sequence, uh, the voxel, uh, two millimeter, uh, the size of two millimeters, and the angular resolution is, is slow. And the, most of the time, you can detect um, the, the crossing fibers. That means in some area of the brain, especially in the brain stem, as Max previously shown, that a lot of uh, fibers crossing in different direction. And with classical diffusion MRI, you can detect uh, this different population of uh, fibers within a, a same area. So there are diff different diffusion model. Uh, as you know, the, the tractography was developed at the very beginning of the 2000, uh, and then uh, most advanced diffusion model were developed. Uh, for example, the orientation distribution function, which is a mathematical model that can depict, can describe uh, the, the, the orientation of water molecule within a voxel, but it can describe different population of uh, fibers in a very narrow space, uh, uh, contrary to the DTI model. So different diffusion model, and when we apply it in a complex crossing fibers areas uh, with the ODF, which is a new model, diffusion model, you, you can have a more precise or more close to the reality uh, result. So if you think about tractography or fiber tracking, you realize that is not a, a unique uh, process. It's, it's a pipeline. It's a multi-steps pipeline from the diffusion MRI acquisition to the final rendering, 
it's very complex. And you have to understand and master all uh, each of the step of the pipeline. So when we start to, to, to this study about cranial nerve tractography, we just uh, look at the scientific literature. We, we found 21 studies of, about cranial nerve tracking, but there was a great variability, a lot of different MRI acquisition settings, a lot of different MRI machine, a lot of different tracking setting, a lot of different software, and finally, a lot of different rendering. So it was hard to, to know what would be the best for a study about unit about chronic nerve tracking. So we, we try to put together all the studies and find the best combination of settings for uh, cranial nerve tractography. And then we think about how to do that in the best way. And we change a little bit the, the strategy of raw design, a way of the, the drawing of the region of interest. And we use the ODF map superimposed on the T2 map to have the best trade-off uh, between the, uh, the anatomy, the anatomical control, which is the T2, and the diffusion uh, working space, which in the ODF map. And we draw a region of interest in three dimension, and then we apply the algorithm. That's a right, different, uh, uh, a new way of thinking about the draw of the, the raw design. And then we start the clinical studies, and we, uh, it was very fun because it, it was our patient and, and we, we have the, the authorization by the local ethical committee to, to just add a one or two sequence for the classical preoperative MRI and just try to work and try to find the, the, best, uh, um, the best way to do cranial nerve tracking. And uh, we, uh, we have this, uh, this 62 patient and we were able to track the cranial nerves on the healthy side for all, all coronaries were tracked. But on the tumor side, we choose to focus on only those uh, that were displaced by tumors. And for those coronaries displaced, we were able to track uh, most of them, 87%. And we were able to control the reality of the tracking in uh, 93%. That was a good, good result. But the most important result of this first clinical study, what we, we realized that if we think about how the tractography uh, would help us for surgical management of our complex skull-based tumors, uh, it helps us for the, in, in a 71 person, either for surgical decision, should we operate or not? Because of we, the, the tractography help us to define the surgical risk. And uh, it helped us to, to, to choose the surgical approach. So should you use uh, this anterior, this lateral, posterior uh, approach? And, uh, and at the end, uh, it, it helped us a lot for the different uh, surgical step. I want to illustrate my, my, my purpose, my talk with uh, some cases. And uh, we have this classical vestibular schwannoma, uh, not so huge, but it was very hard to find the, the position of the facial nerve. That is usually the case. But in this case, we were able to track and to differentiate, to distinguish the, the facial nerve and the, and the cochlear uh, nerve. And we had this uh, anterior position of the facial nerve. Then we, we, we were able to move fast at the beginning of the dissection to debulk uh, quickly the tumor and then carefully dissect the, the, the facial nerve. So it was a, a good help for the preoperative pl planning and also for lead surgery and the different uh, step of the removal. Another case would be this petroclival meningioma or the upper uh, clival meningioma. Uh, we, uh, we, we were able to, to describe the position of the oculomotor nerve, which, were, which was uh, displaced superiorly. And uh, then we were able to, uh, to, to see the, the position of the trigeminal and abdescence nerve. And then we choose a septemporal pouch uh, that allows us to spare the, the force 
uh, five and six cranial nerves. So it was very uh, useful to anticipate the surgical uh, the traps and then to adjust and to tailor the surgical approach uh, for this tumor. Another illustrative case is uh, this giant epidermal cyst with supra-infratentral extension. And if you look at the classical uh, MRI, you can't very, uh, uh, you, you can see the position of the cranial nerve. You are not sure this one is the third. You, you can do that. Maybe this one is the fifth, but the, the, the tractography uh, uh, showed us that this one is, was really the third nerve and it was more uh, easy to, to see the, the position of the cranial nerve within the, the cyst. And then we were able to do the, the surgery with more confidence because before doing the surgery, uh, we renewed the position of uh, most of the cranial nerves. Um, we had this other case, which is not, which was not, we did, didn't belong to the study, but it was very interesting. At the beginning of our cranial nerve uh, study, uh, we had this uh, young lady who was hit by a bus and she, she wake up uh, with a, a very st strange uh, clinic symptoms. She had an isolated left oculomotor palsy. And when you look at the classical MRI, you can see like uh, actional uh, diffuse lesions, but the brainstem was uh, completely free of uh, ischemic or traumatic uh, lesions. So we were not able to explain uh, this uh, isolated left oculomotor palsy. And then we, we decided to, to test if the tractography can help us in this uh, case. And as you can see on the, on the left, on the right uh, picture, when you apply the tracking on both uh, third cranial nerve, you can see on the right side, the trajectory of, of the nerve, but on the left side, there was a sharp arrest of the third cranial nerve just before entering the cavernous sinus. So it was unfortunately a, a cut or like a, yeah, a, a cut be, uh, because of the TBI. So another case was this very large uh, arachnoid cyst and uh, we test uh, the tractography of cranial nerve. So when we try to put the in 3D, the position of cranial nerve, it draw us the window or the working space we will have, we would have in surgery. So we have like the, the same uh, window, like with the acoustic fascial bundle pushed superiorly and the lower nerve, the ninth and the rootlets of the 10th the nerve uh, pushed inferiorly. And we, we could uh, anticipate the window, the working space or the surgical corridor we would have in surgery using this tractography that, were, that was very useful. And uh, th this, uh, this technique was not perfect and we had difficulty because of cranial nerve. And as you can imagine, the cranial nerve are not uh, anatomically uh, preserved in case of complex tu tumor. And uh, most of the time I use the picture of kanji wrapping because the, the wrap, the, the membranes of the, the tumor most of the time, the cranial nerves are flattened exactly like the membranes of the tumor. So the, the, the anatomy of the nerve is, is completely different. So it's, it, it makes the tracking very, very hard. And uh, the, the tumor could, could uh, be another trap because of the diffusion signal is very similar to the nerve. Imagine a vestibular schwannoma, which is a tumor of the... Um, uh, of the membrane exactly of the nerve. So the diffusion signal is the same than the cranial nerve. So that makes the tracking very difficult. The proximity, the, the close relationships with brain stim is also another trap because, because a lot of uh, tracks within the brain stim, it can uh, disturb uh, the tracking of tiny fibers of cranial nerve. So there are a lot of you know, problems you need to solve distortion um, up at the skull base, which are very huge uh, because of the close interface between uh, brain, hair, uh, water, etc. 
you also need a ground truth control. You can track anything, but you need to control what you what, what you are doing. So that's another um, another trap, and uh, you have to find a good. The, the best trade-off between the machine time, you can put the, you can't put the patient doing hours in the MRI machine to get some beautiful images. You need to have a trade-off between MRI machine time, post-treatment time, etc. And then if you want to do that, you need skills in anatomy, yeah, for sure, but also in uh, MRI and computer science to do all the steps of the pipeline. So, when I uh, was in the middle of this study, I just uh, continued my, my, you know, searching in the scientific literature. And uh, there, they had this paper of uh, Juan's team and about chronic nerve tracking in healthy conditions. And uh, I, I thought, okay, I, I need to be there. So uh, I, I asked Juan, and uh, he was uh, very fastly okay to to for me to be there. So I. Thanks, thanks a lot, Juan, because it was very, very good to, to, go, to go to Pittsburgh to and move forward with, with this 2D. And then we changed our mind and we decided to use the, the software of tracking uh, designed in Pittsburgh by Frankier, which is DSI Studio. And we, we changed our mind, changed our strategy to do the, uh, the chronic of tracking. We use like a, a, a unique region of interest that include all the brain stem, all the cerebellum, all the cranial nerve skull based systems. And uh, we apply like a, a deterministic algorithm to, to do a full track to full tractography. And uh, we have this result, like a reconstruction of the wool, wool working space with the cerebellum, brain stem and cranial nerve. It was very, very nice, but this one was like a, a healthy, healthy uh, patient. So we have very promising results. So we decided to move forward and try to use this technique for our clinical cases. And uh, yeah, if you zoom, you can see quite good details of the, uh, the anatomy using MRI diffusion tracking. So that's promising, very promising. You can see the anterior pedicular fossa, the cerebral, cerebral pointing angle. And uh, then we, we try to, to move forward. So, I wanted to show you uh, this video about how we did this. So just, I will put my, uh, okay. Can you see the screen or not? Okay, just, I, I just to share uh, we, this we cannot, one. We cannot see. Okay, okay, I will. You have I'll to change. change the screen you're sharing. Exactly, okay, I will. So close uh, this one and open the new one. Uh -huh. Okay, this way, it could be better. Is, is it better? You got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so this one uh, is, is like a huge vestibular schwannoma. And uh, we try to, to apply this one, like a unique, huge region of interest. And we neg negated uh, it uh, to have uh, a greater region of avoidance to remove uh, all, all of the, the, the things outside the region of interest to working space. And then we applied a full uh, brain steam uh, tractography. We did a cl little cleanup, but at the end, the result is quite good. You have the anatomy and the tumor within its full uh, anatomical environment. You can see the third nerve, the trigeminal nerve, sixth nerve, the lower, the acoustic fascial bundle. And that's fun because Using this technique, if you you can move around and you can see in a 3D and you can anticipate uh, the position of cranial nerve and it helps a lot to create your own mental map as a neurosurgeon. You have thanks to this tool uh, a very uh, a very useful mental map of the position of the vessel or cranial nerves around the tumor. And if you look at very carefully, maybe you can see the facial nerve and the uh, cochlear nerve, which uh, seems to be separated. And uh, you have the feeling that the facial nerve will be very anterior to the tumor. So that's, that's a good, uh, good tool we, we had. So I will share more of my presentation. Yes, so I continue. 
And uh, we had another example of the P2 clavial management on the, on the left side, and we tried to, um, to apply it with the same case I presented just before. And then we applied the, the, this full track tractography uh, a pipeline on, on these cases, and, and we have the, the same perspective. We had the third nerve uh, going superiorly, and we can uh, anticipate the position of cranial nerve all around the, the tumor in the, in the anatomical environment, and we can turn around the brain stem and see the difference. Uh, uh, potential uh, surgical approach, and using this, uh, we uh, we confirm the the best uh, uh, surgical corridor we can use for access to the tumor using this tool. Yeah, now the yeah, that's the same case, large vestibular schanoma, and uh, the the most uh, important uh, um, help is to create a three D mental map for the for the surgeon, right? And then we we. We thought about the, the, the fact that we had uh, optimized the MRI settings. So we need to do to, to know if the pipeline of full tractography can, can be applied in any uh, uh, data set of MRI. So we put one patient of the human connectome project very randomly, and we we put this, uh, we apply we applied the, the pipeline to this patient, and the result is quite uh, interest, uh, interesting because we have a very clean uh, uh, constriction of the brainstem cerebellum or some corneas, but as you can you can see the mesencephalum is not good and the corneal nerves are cut very shortly uh, in the systemal uh, trajectory. So that's good, not perfect, but the, the pipeline is not not so bad. And uh, once again, we have uh, uh, some difficult. Uh, using this uh, uh, this technique, and uh, there are a lot of traps to be solved, and we are still working on it, as you can uh, as you can imagine. And the best uh, the, the best the best point for me is to try to apply this technique or make this tractography uh, applicable in the clinical practice, in the routine practice of all of us. And uh, that's why I, I'm keep working, but. We have a lot of, of problem. We face a lot of problem, um, especially the, the difference between the, the machine, MRI machine, with a lot of different parameters. So I try to, to work on this. And, and also another point, it's what, what would be the perspective of using this uh, promising tool in the, in the clinical practice? We can uh, try to reduce the spatial resolution uh, thanks to upsampling. Upsampling is a, uh, is a, an also tool uh, within the, the software DSI studio. You, you can put, you can start from a um, two millimeters voxel and you can try to, to get some 1.5 millimeter voxel with a very, very uh, increased uh, spatial resolution. So that could be a, a good uh, perspective. Another one would be try to move forward in the Automatization of the of the of the process. Try to remove the uh, operative dependent step, um, and the uh, the clustering and machine learning would be another perspective because it can uh, detect the the similar orientation of ODF. Uh, remember the the diffusion model, and uh, it can uh, automatically reconstruct some corner nerve if you. Uh, if you train the machine to do that. So it could be a, a very good perspective. Another one is if you uh, look at uh, very regularly some uh, ODF map and various uh, tumor, uh, skull-based tumors, you will have the, the feeling that in most of case, uh, the ODF signal, which has, we will have a, a pattern, a recurrent pattern if you look at uh, this uh, ODF, when uh, in, in this case of huge uh, CPA meningioma, you will have the feeling that the ODF signal will, will have a very centripetal pattern. Uh, in case of schwannoma, the ODF will be like a turning around the tumor, turning within the tumor. And in case of epidemic cyst, the ODF signal will be like completely chaotic. So, that could be a, a promising perspective because uh, if you look at the ODF map, you, you can have like a, an histological uh, uh, 
uh, diagnosis before doing the surgery. So it could be a, a help. Uh, of course, there are a lot of older perspective, uh, uh, like a spinal cord um, tractography. So I, I don't have to, to do uh, a lot about that, but I just wanted to thank you very much for listening to me today. And I'm very, very honored to be a part of this meeting. And then thanks Juan. Uh, thanks to all of the attendees, all of the faculty for beautiful dissection. And uh, yeah, I, I wish you a, a very nice day and hope you, uh, we will learn more about anatomy in the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Beautiful presentation. Um, it, it really is impressive. Some of your reconstructions are very impressive. Uh, uh, I don't know if anyone will make a comment, anybody, but it, it is really impressive the ability to see the cranial nerves in a, in a vestibular schwannoma, for example. So uh, I do have one comment and a, and a question. So the software you're using, uh, I, I would recommend anybody with interest to use it because it's a great software for surgical planning. I've used it for many years when I'm doing brain tumors. Um, and for the fibers in, inside the brain, you know, you can uh, do this modeling and you can actually even see it in 3D. You can do surgical planning. You have a, your own surgical planning station and it's free. You know, it's a free software. And, and so it's very useful for planning, but it is time consuming. So what I want to ask you, uh, Tim, is how long does it take to um, clean up, to dissect digitally, as we say, because this is like doing white matter dissection, but in a computer, how long does it mm -hmm. take to get to, the, to your final product that you are satisfied with? Oh, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. <laughs> this software is very useful and I have, thanks to you, the opportunity to work in the office just close to the developer of the software. The front query was just close to me during my, my stay in Pittsburgh. So it was easy for me to, to learn more about the, the software because I have the opportunity to ask a lot of questions for Frank and to, to solve a lot of problems. So. Yeah, you, you are completely right. So it takes time to be confident, uh, comfortable with the use of surgery, but it's, it's doable. Every, every body we, we want to evolve in it can, can do it. So for me, if I, uh, we, we learn uh, to, to the applying in clinical practice, so we want to, the, the, this technique is, uh, is usable for everyone. So we try to reduce the time we spend on the software. So at the end, when I apply the full tractography, I just need 50 minutes just to clean a little bit with the mouse. I remove all the strong or false continuations. So I need uh, at the end 30 minutes from the beginning to the end. It's like 50 minutes to you know, do the step of the tracking and then 50 minutes to clean. That's wonderful because that's usually the same time it would take me when I when I bring, I was. I bring two more case maybe less because it's it's easier to see the you know the yeah. bigger fiber tracks but and and that's why it's also you know often be asked by other surgeons so let's do fiber tracking I want to see it so if they think that you do fiber tracking and boom the fiber tracks yeah. are nicely displayed and there you go that's your fiber tracking it's not like that the good fiber tracking requires time. And it is like doing a dissection in your own case. And when you're used to it, it might take 10, 20 minutes, but if you want to do it better, it takes longer. So it yeah. requires some time work. Anyway. The, problem, the problem is, is when we want to do uh, fiber tracking for the brain, you need to separate the different tracks. So that's why we, we change the, the, the approach. It, okay, we, we don't want to separate, to distinguish every tract. You just uh, want to see the tumor within the anatomical environment. So that was the change of perspective, which helped us to do that, like a full tractography. And then after that, with your anatomical experience, you can distinguish the, the different, different cranial nerves. But uh, yeah, the, the problem is you need time if you want to separate any tracts, any cranial nerves. Yeah. Wonderful, fantastic job. So um, we have next speaker, Dr. Uh, Seker from Tur Turkey. Um, it is great to see you again and to have you today with us. I'm very intrigued to know what your surgical approaches to diffusion putting glioma is going to be about because this is a very you know difficult uh, area. So please ask him.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you see the uh, screen? My screen? Yeah. Okay, good. No, no, we cannot, we cannot see your screen. You cannot see? No. Hold on one second. Right now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, good morning again. Uh, yeah, please, all, press, sorry, click presentation mode. You are on, on the uh, um, presenter's view, not the presentation mode. Oh, you are, but change the screen. Okay, okay, hold on one second. There you go. Presenter view. Presenter view? I think so. Let's try. Okay. Is it okay right now? No. Oh, click, you see up there, uh, um, like two windows on the top. I yes. think you can swap it there. You can flip it up there. Right now? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah there, on the other corner. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go back. Um, yes. Okay. There you go. You got it. Perfect. Okay, now... Uh... First of all, I'd like to thank uh, to Juan, uh, organizing committee and Abuzer for inviting me here. And it's really great honor for me uh, to speak, uh, to see you after a while uh, in front of masters, uh, Rotom fellows and friends. It's really great honor for me. Now I want to talk about surgical approaches to diffuse pontine gliomas. Diffuse intrinsic uh, pontine glioma, from now on I will call it a DIPG, uh, has dismal prognosis, uh, poor prognosis, and overall median survival is 9 to uh, 11 months. Uh, brainstem tumors are prevalent, uh, especially in pediatric population, and it accounts 13% of uh, all primary CNS tumors in child uh, age group. And it has a peak incidence uh, between five and 10 years uh, and without gender bias. The clinical presentation has classical trade of long trunks uh, signs with motor weakness, cranial neuropathies and cerebellar signs. The diagnosis is with history, neurological examination, and with brain imaging. And it has a typical uh, characteristics of MRI findings. I, I will show you in representative cases and we'll talk in details. And for now, uh, the IPG is unresectable because of its loca location and because of infiltrative nature to the surrounding structures. And uh, unfortunately, who grade did not influence the survival. And in the most recent who classification, uh, it's classified as midline gliomas, uh, who grade four, uh, and regardless of the histology. First of all, uh, the, for the treatment, it's the radiation therapy, but uh, it adds only three to four months to survival and then followed by chemotherapy. Unfortunately, clinical or radiographic tumor progression uh, seen three to eight months after completion of therapy. Ask him, excuse, me, excuse me to interrupt you again. Um, can you go to present? You are still, we're seeing the window, but we're still seeing your desktop on the background. See okay. if you can maximize your, your uh, slide. Hold on. Um, there you okay. go. Yep. Okay. No. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good. Very good. Uh, in recent case, the survival has not improved despite several treatment strategies that have been uh, explored. 
And in, this is uh, the picture from PubMed. Uh, it shows the DIPG researchers. Uh, and in the last two decades, uh, people focus, researchers focused on uh, the, for, uh, to find the uh, chemotherapy or uh, any treatment method uh, method uh, for DIPG. And we see the, how uh, people focused, especially last, in the last two decades. In the 80s, uh, it was said uh, the biopsy was unnecessary, but in the last decade for the standard of K, uh, the tissue is necessary for clinical trials, uh, especially for genetic and molecular studies. Uh, so uh, the uh, stereotactic uh, biopsy uh, is done before the treatment. Although it, the complication is, uh, rate is very low, with the uh, stereotactic biopsy, we see uh, in some reports uh, dissemination through the needle uh, trajectory of the tumor. Total resection uh, for focal, superficial, and exophytic lesions uh, is in, uh, possible, for, but uh, for intrinsic brain stem gliomas, it's not uh, possible. So uh, uh, DTI, uh, in previous lectures, we had a good presentations uh, before the operation, functional tracts and the tumor and uh, where can be visualized and we can choose a trajectory to the target area by the help of DTI uh, imaging. What's the goal of the surgery? The goal of the surgery is partially debug the tumor to confirm the diagnosis and improve the symptoms of the patient. Here is the representative case. A four-year-old boy diagnosed the IPG one year ago, and he had a radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And he presented to us, uh, uh, he, when he came to us, he was drowsy, sleepy uh, in her mom's head. Uh, confined to bed, left hemiplegic, facial palsy, difficult of swallowing, and uh, the oncologist sent uh, him to home, said, saying terminal stage. We get the uh, MRI, and in, in T2 uh, weighted images, we see an infiltrative uh, pontine glioma, uh, and the, in a uh, contrast enhanced tumor uh, images, we see the uh, peripheral uh, contrast enhancement and necrosis uh, in the center of the tumor. Uh, with DTI, uh, I prefer raw uh, data because uh, reconstruction of the DTI tracks is not easy as in normal cases in this infiltrative tumor. So we can see all the uh, structures uh, with the raw data and we can, uh, so we saw that the tumor pushed normal structures to the periphery and make a corridor to remove uh, and debug the tumor. Uh, so we thought that we can help the patient uh, by surgery. We got these uh, MRI images uh, we, uh, without giving any sedation or neuro, uh, any anesthesia to the patient. He was uh, just lying still. So we put the MRI machine and we got these images and without any sedation. So think about the patient situation before the operation. So uh, after uh, checking the MRIs, we decided to go to lateral infratrigeminal lateral window. So uh, we have seen very good anatomical dissections, but just to go uh, overview, this is the trigeminal nerve, middle cerebral pedicle fibers, crossing over the pontine uh, midline. And on lateral view, we see medial lemniscus, cortical spinal tract, medial lemniscus, ventral cone, and dorsal cone. 
and we see the cortical spinal tract. These are from Roton collections, these um, dissections. Uh, this is the anterior view, uh, cortical spinal tract, cortical bulbar tract, and we see the cortical pontine tract. On the lateral view, we see uh, trigeminal nerve, seven and eight here. So the, our uh, entry point is here, sub trigeminal, infra trigeminal corridor. So by this trajectory, we can reach all of these area. This is the uh, retrosigmoid approach. Cerebellum was retracted. We see trigeminal nerve, seven and eight, seventh nerve, nine, 10, 11. And this is the area uh, interest uh, that we will go in. And this is the incision, again, trigeminal nerve and uh, seven and eight. Uh, we see closer view and six nerve. Now the uh, operative video I want to show you. This is the lower cranial nerves, nine, 10, 11. We dissect the arachnoid and uh, this is the trigeminal nerve. Now we are dissecting the uh, seven and eight and we are checking with intraoperative monitorization. See the pons uh, and and occupied the uh, pedicular cisterns, interpedicular and pontine cistern. Now we are uh, doing incision infra trigeminal area. And yes, we saw the tumor here. It is the grayish tumor. Now we are getting biopsy for pathology and for the genetic and molecular research, then by using ultrasonic aspirator, we are removing the tumor, see the normal tissue color and the uh, normal tissue color and the tumor color is, so we can differentiate macroscopically. As, as we reject the tumor, uh, it comes to our view, see, no, not much uh, retraction. So we reject it and it comes to our view. Again, we are debulking the tumor. So the pulse getting smaller in size and we see the cisterns. This is trigeminal nerve again. So it's really very difficult then after removing the necrotic. Three months after the operation. And this is the post-operative video. I try to put uh, same slices, see. Uh, after resection, the pulse come to uh, normal, uh, not exactly normal, but close to normal uh, shape. And the normal uh, neural tissue debulked and the patient improved the symptoms. And he had a chance for uh, ray irradiation or for clinical trials uh, for uh, chemotherapy agents uh, and the surgery added his uh, quality of life, I think. And this is the T2 images. Again, see the preoperative and postoperative. videos. So uh, the, the second case, this is the last case. I want, uh, I want, uh, I don't want to show all of them, but just I cho have chosen two cases to show you. Again, same history is a four year old boy diagnosed the IPG one year ago. He had a radiation therapy and chemotherapy presented almost same precomatose quadriparatic facial palsy difficult of swallowing. And here is the preoperative MRI.
again, very huge tumor, uh, with contrasting periphery of the tumor and necrosis in the center. We operated, decided to operate from posterior uh, approach through the fourth ventricle. Uh, here is the schematic representation that we can reach is approach. It's also mentioned in Maximiliano's uh, presentation, very nice. I won't go in deep details, but we have to know very vital structures, facial colliculus, vagal and hypoglossal triangles, and uh, the safe entry zones, either supra or infra uh, facial colliculus. It was mentioned in detail. And here is the post-operative video of the patient. And again, uh, the symptoms of the patient improved. He, he survived 10 months after uh, his last situation. So I think with this surgery, we added 10 months in, for the survival. Uh, and for these tumors, uh, first of all, uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy then surgery. Normally for the brain tumors, we operate and send patient to oncology. But here is the reverse. First, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. Then if we need, we can do surgery. So uh, our, my aim is not to uh, reject all the intrinsic brain tumors, uh, pontine gliomas. The take home message here is BIPG is unresectable. OK, we, I accept. But large tumors may push vital structures, causing space to operate these tumors. Perioperative MRI, especially BFTI, helpful for deciding, and surgery may help to patients in selected cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Askin. That was uh, very impressive. Um, great going into those, let's say, inoperable tumors. Excellent job. Um, we have one question, uh, team from the audience, that they're asking if you have experienced bony artifacts during DTI study. For example, can you follow the optic nerve into the optic canal or inside the bone? Can you follow fiber, uh, fiber uh, tracks or, or nerves in this case? Yes, we have a very problem with bony artifacts. Uh, may, maybe Jack has much more experience with that, but we really have uh, big problems with bone, uh, closer to bony structures. Tim, you yeah. want to comment too? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. That, that's a crucial point. Uh, the thing is, when you want to do fiber tracking on anything on the skull base, you need to do a very uh, careful uh, uh, correction of uh, distortion artifacts. Uh, that's a very uh, important first step. And if you do that, uh, we, uh, we have the, the, the experience that we can follow the, the optic nerve from the, from the brain, from, from the cerebrum, from the brain to, to, the, uh, to, to the eye. But the, the point is, most of the time, there is a, a huge loss of diffusion signal uh, when quinine is entering the skull base. Uh, but after correction of the distortion artifact, you can improve the results. But the, 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 this artifact has a very crucial point. Excellent. Well, um, Dr. Seger, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Um, sure. I think many have been waiting, you know, for quite some time to have Dr. Ture come up and 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 uh, have the screen. Um, it is truly an honor, Dr. Ture, to have you with us tonight or this morning for you guys. Um, and sir, you know, you are well aware that you started a lot of the things you are seeing here today inspiring white matter anatomy studies and fiber tractography studies to do better surgery for tumors that are difficult to understand or inoperable. So please enlighten us with your expertise on applying 
white matter anatomy to show you it. So, good morning, good afternoon, good night, especially Juan, you are still <laughs> alive. <laughs> Another part of the world. I would like to congratulate you for such a great uh, meeting, especially in difficult time with COVID-19. But uh, I think Professor, if Professor Rotton would alive, alive, he would be very, very happy to have such a great uh, meeting. And it's great honor for me to be part of this uh, meeting. And I really thank you for great uh, invitation. And I am very happy to listen this morning such a great, great lectures. I don't know which one was the best one, really. I mean, uh, uh, congratulations. So my talk is the impact of the uh, white matter dissection for micro neurosurgical procedures. Why I had this title? I gave a lecture and uh, courses in many part of the world. And some people ask me after the uh, lecture, uh, dissections, hands-on dissections, some people ask me that, Dr. Ture, it was very nice course. Thank you very much. But why we are doing this? <laughs> it is a difficult uh, answer for me. I think the fiber dissection can help us to respect normal brain tissue. If it's this, it's enough, I think. I, am, I will be very happy with what I talk. Just we have to respect the normal brain tissue. Brain is not like a yogurt or pudding, like Professor Yashargil mentioned. It's heterogeneous, very holy, very special organ that we don't know really how it's working. So as a neurosurgeon, we have to respect. That's enough. Of course, it helps much more. So I can share you with my experience that what, what, in what cases the, the fiber dissection helped me. First of all, the, we have some information about white matter. And white matter makes up about 50% of brain volume. And there are axons and myelinated and unmyelinated fibers. And also they estimated that 160,000 kilometers of myelinated fibers uh, are in the with, uh, white matter. Imagine in this 21st century, we are talking about putting a chip uh, in the brain and to control the human brain or something. We should not exaggerate. Still, we don't know what is the percentage of unmyelinated fibers, what is the percentage of myelinated fibers. Still, we don't know. And we don't know the real difference between them also. This is another story. So we, we know nothing about white matter or we have nothing about brain. Just as a neurosurgeon in this century, we have to respect and we have to try to help the patient as much as possible. This story started in 17th century. Visions is the first man that he published book and he described that there is a fiber system in the white matter. And then rail uh, find out the alcohol for fixation of brain. This is the most important step in the uh, history of neuroanatomy because after that the brain studies are started. And then these are the people, uh, early neuroanatomists that work on the fiber dissection. We have to respect all of them. And uh, in the 20th century, the fi uh, fiber dissection is neglected because of the uh, histological techniques came out. And very few people interested with it. And the most important one, Joseph Klingler, and he published his best atlas in 56. And I was lucky enough in 1990 that I was in Professor Yashargi's department. And then I had a chance to see uh, Klingler's specimens in, uh, in the anatomy department. It is in the corner. I strongly recommend that you have to see them. And it was my hobby to study, to learn this in, uh, intrinsic anatomy of the brain. And I had privilege to learn this 
and Professor Yashargil was his student, Pilingler's student. And Professor Yashargil also did the excellent dissection in 1953. And I was a second year of resident and I had lucky that I was playing with the brain. It was just my hobby. I didn't know that I can give a lecture someday. Also, I couldn't imagine that I can listen excellent, excellent lectures from all over the world today. Uh, there is no, uh, I cannot explain my feeling. I'm very happy. And during this time in 10 years, nobody interested with fiber dissection. Professor Yashargil was telling everyone, nobody except uh, Professor El Mefti and uh, also Professor Friedman. And I published this paper at that time. It was a difficult paper because that I was telling that superior occipital fasciculus may not exist. And I'm very happy that now Juan published real scientific paper that he couldn't demonstrate also. <laughs> I am the luckiest person that he supported this, uh, he, not he supported, he found out that it's not exist. This is very important. And then we published this paper in 2000. And very important thing that I have to tell, this technique is still limited. This, even I use, I introduced microscope, I introduced microfiber dissection, it is still limited. It is still brutal. And demonstration of one fiber system often result in the destruction of the other fiber system. So we have to be careful about it. And it's better to combine with histological techniques. And today, tractograph. At that time, there were no tractograph. And I am the luckiest person because the tractography came out that time. And then this uh, technique is uh, well accepted. And again, I am the luckiest person because Professor Oliveira immediately, when he saw, immediately he understand the importance of this technique and he supported me like many uh, neurosurgeons from all over the world, including me. I'm very grateful and lucky to know him as a, my mentor and he invited me San Paolo and this is the first fiber dissection course in the world. And then we did this in, uh, in St. Louis routinely. And it is historical picture also. Dr. Ribas is here, Dr. Christ is here, Gusmao here, Paolo, Paolo here, and Dr. Haynes uh, is here. I'm very happy that it's coming better. And this is also an important picture that we introduced this in Braga course and uh, Juan is here. And Professor Oliveira is here and Professor Oliveira asked Dr. Roton that Juan should work on his lab. And I think this is the greatest moment because Juan uh, disseminated this uh, dissection and improved and the best quality and he disseminated all over the world. I am very thankful to him and I congratulate him. So, but today, in with modern techniques, modern tractography and everything, still we are dealing with this problem. <laughs> this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. To use, especially the tractography, should not be misused for disruptive surgery. We should respect. There is no safe part of the brain to remove. We should respect. I like to show some samples. Please note that left is left all over in my slides. This is what my orientation is that like this. So this is left here. This is right. In my surgery, in MRI, I have to put everything together in 3D, in tractography also. So this is five years old female, left-sided slight hemiparesis. Where is this tumor? For me, the main point is the, what is the origin of the tumor? It looks like internal capsule. First of all, this is not insular tumor. This is not putaminal tumor. It looks like internal capsule tumor, but uh, patient has just slight hemiparesis. It's not thalamic tumor. 
Look at this MRI again. Very strange, very special location. And fortunately, very rare location. And tractography gives some idea, even very primitive tractography at that time. You see sensory fibers move medially. Right side tumor. And then the motor fibers move medially and posteriorly, even we couldn't show it in the extension. But this is limitation of the tractography at that time. Today, uh, we can do much better. Where, what is the origin of this tumor? If I couldn't understand origin of this tumor, I should not touch. It is globus pallidus tumor. Globus pallidus tumor, very rare. This is right putamen, right internal capsule, anterior commissure. And the globus pallidus is just here, just back from the uh, anterior commissure and pyramidal tractus is just running. And how can I reach there? Impossible to reach globus pallidus without cutting some part of the brain. So which part of the brain I have to cut? It's impossible. But we are lucky that tumor help us. Because if I follow the lenticulostrate arteries, I can find the uh, globus pallidus internus, posterior globus pallidus. But it's dangerous, I know. But if you look at it, if, if you go to Sylvia Vallecula, if you follow the lenticulostrate, tumor trying to come to surface, you see, it is almost in one millimeter here, two millimeters. So if I find the lenticulostrate and follow it, I can reach the tumor. If I can reach the tumor, I hope I can remove the tumor. And this is right side, the M1 here, and this is the main lenticular straight. Sylvian opening, Transylvian approach. And just the lenticular straight, I should follow. And this is after resection. This is lenticular straight arteries. These are lenticular arteries. And ICG shows that they are intact. It was strange tumor. If I, I, don't, I don't understand in the MRI, I don't understand in the surgery, I don't understand in the frozen, even the pathologist doesn't understand what was it. And it was like this. And at the end of that, they asked the people, but this is post-operative MRI. Look at this. Put a man intact, globus pallidus intact, anterior portion, tumor was just here, and the internal capsule is totally intact. So the tumor was just coming from one corner in the globus pallidus. And this was my entrance. You see, I just followed the lenticular straight and removed the tumor. And his the postoperative tractography also showed almost normal uh, sensory and motor fibers. And we were very happy. But the histopathology, the, we asked the Mayo Clinic also for the histopathology, and they said that PNET, which is the most malignant tumor. And we gave radiation to her, but she is totally intact today. And she is normal, but because of the radiation, she is, her head is not very high. I am very sorry that we gave radiation, but it was, I think it was pylostic astrocytoma. The diagnosis was wrong. Another case, right-sided, entire mediobasal temporal region tumor, entire, from piriform cortex to isthmus. But you see, these tumors are stay in the uh, mediobasal temporal region. Medial side is the choroidal fissure, lateral is the collateral uh, uh, fissure, collateral uh, sulcus, and superior is the temporal horn. So very nice tumors. They are always like this, mediobasal temporal tumors are very nice to remove it. But how can I remove it to get all of them? If I go from anterior, I cannot reach this part. I'm not discussing to go to lateral. If we go to lateral, I have to stop talking. 
because this is totally against uh, our philosophy that we should uh, preserve the normal tissue. The, not only the optic radiation, there are many fibers uh, in this uh, white matter. So the best way is the going posterior. Yashar Gil described this for posterior mediobasal uh, temporal cavernoma. And then Professor Yonekawa and Professor Oliveira also performed this approach for posterior mediobasal. But I use this technique for entire length of the uh, mediobasal temporal region, including amygdala and preform cortex. And I found it, it's, I worked in the lab many years and then I found it very useful. This is right side, semi-sitting position. When you cut it, the tumor is hanging and you can get all tumor in one session. And this is a right side, choroid plexus is here, atrium, the inferior uh, temporal arteries. And uh, this is amygdala was here. And th this is internal capsule, uh, internal carotid artery. This is third nerve, and this is anterior choroidal artery. And this is choroid plexus. So in one session, just remove the entire length of the mediobasal temporal region. And this is the position of the uh, surgeon when I remove the amygdala. The removing amygdala is the easiest part of surgery. The most difficult part is the middle fossa down. So I use endoscope in that part uh, to remove the uh, inferior part in the middle fossa part uh, of the tumor. And this was after resection, right side, you see it without touching anything, it's possible to remove the piriform cortex up to the uh, isthmus singly. So, and so it's nice to see postoperative tractography. I always perform to check my quality of my surgery. And this is uncinate, this is front occipital, and this is posterior thalamic peduncle that the so-called temporal stem is intact. Another way, temporal stem is the not anatomic word. It's not in the nomina anatomica, and there is no clear description of temporal stem. Where is temporal stem? There is no clear description, but we are using so much. And this was postoperative. And then I use this technique for uh, selective amygdala hippocampectomy, and it is, this is left-sided hippocampal sclerosis in the same technique, and you can also perform tap electrode or something. So this is after resection. So this is the tentorium and cerebral, uh, cerebral peduncle, P3. Amygdala was here, piriform cortex was here, and the roof of the temporal horn, lateral geniculate body, choroid plexus, internal carotid is here, middle cerebral is here. This is tentorial edge. So I found this is uh, much more useful. What is the advantage? I can remove the tail of the hippocampus. And also I do not need to uh, deal with the neocortex. Transylvian approach is excellent. I love it. But this is I love more. Professor Yashargil is supporting me this. He's, he watched my surgeries and then he said that this is the better way. But he says, but it is more difficult. I totally respect what he's thinking, but for me, this is less difficult than uh, Transylvian approach. And I, am, uh, I hope the young generation will accept this for especially epilepsy surgery, because epilepsy surgery is 10 times easier than uh, tumors because the hippocampus is atrophic, very small. And I can remove long part of the hippocampus without touching anything. And this is after resection. Left side, you see, I came here and so-called temporal stem is intact. And all connections are intact. And visual field also. And other things, again, about the flare images. You know, some people say that you have to remove everything in flare. Please don't do it, very dangerous. Look at this, this is right-sided middle singlet tumor and singulum is running there. But tumors are not simply following the fiber tracts. 
This is another story. Tumor growing pattern is another story. And then this is another problem, the, to remove everything in flare. And this is diffuse tumor and you have to remove everything. Look at this. This is uh, singulum, right side. This is interhemispheric approach after resection. And three months later, I just removed the tumor. And three months later, this is, you see, the tumor was in one corner in the uh, cingulate. And even main portion of the cingulum is intact postoperatively. So fiber dissection at least gave me this idea that I have to respect the normal brain as much as possible. Another case, thalamus tumors. Thalamus tumors, I have 100 now. Never invade the internal capsule. They don't go to internal capsule. Lucky, we are lucky. And the vascularization is totally different. And they don't invade the internal capsule. So, and it's possible to remove without going through the neocortex. This is the, in this case, and also thalamus tumor never invade the midbrain. It just pushed down the midbrain. And this is herniated part of the thalamus tumor, but midbrain is intact. And you see always sensory and motor fibers push laterally. And this is the best case for to use transcalosal approach to get the lateral ventricular surface of the thalamus and then remove the tumor. And this is after resection. And you can get from here to down. Just, you see the midbrain is intact, internal capsule is intact. And we have to respect the normal brain. Another case, again, the posterior thalamic tumor, pulvinar tumor, more localized. So in this case, you know, there is normal thalamus here. If I come from uh, transcalosal, I should pass through the normal thalamus. In this case, I use posterior interhemispheric subsplenial approach, not cutting the splenium, subsplenial approach, and to use cisternal surface of the thalamus because pulvinar is in the surface. Pulvinar is not deep structure. It's in the system. And fortunately, I have now intraoperative MRI. Three years ago, we got it. But I have to tell you, intraoperative ultrasound is much more important. Of course, intraoperative MRI is nice, but, uh, but navigation also not useful for brain tumors, in for brain surgery. It's good for skull base, but for brain, I do not use it because it, it may confuse me, you know. It, I have a picture in my brain, navigation can destroy, destroy it. Which one is important, intraoperative MRI or ultrasound? It's not correct to co compare them. They, it's, they are different. First of all, intraoperative ultrasound is best for navigation, and you can use 10 times in the surgery. But intraoperative MRI, you can use one time, maximum two times. If you give uh, contrast, you cannot use anymore. So it looks like a, one is car, one is airplane. Which one is important? They both are important, but they are different. But if I have to choose one of them, I prefer car because I need my car every day. Especially in Corona days, I cannot use airplane. And this is intraoperative MRI shows that uh, tumor removed. And this is three months later. You see that this tumor is also very, has very nice border and everything in flare we cannot remove. And this is after resection, posterior interhemispheric, subsplenial approach. Another case, pulvinar tumor, but it is totally hidden under the uh, splenium. So this is not suitable for posterior interhemispheric approach. It is not suitable for transcalosal also because the ventricle are very small. If ventricle very small, transcalosal is not Good. And also there are normal uh, thalamus here. So it's excellent for supracerebellar infratentorial approach. Again, the sensory and motor fibers. Just go to pulvinar through the supracerebellar approach, which I love it. 
only disadvantage of this approach, I cannot use intraoperative MRI and just perimedian supracerebellar transdentorial approach. I cannot show video, I don't have time, but this is, you see the angle of surgery without cutting anything, just remove the tumor. Just remove the tumor, pulvinar and medial uh, uh, thalamus tumor, right side. And the post-operative tractography also shows normal fiber system. I like to show some cases in brainstem. First of all, I, I like to make, keep in your mind that there is no safe entry zone. Forget the safe entry zone. <laughs> if you listen to Dr. Max, Maximiliano's lecture, <laughs> where was the safe entry zone? He beautifully demonstrated everything and every millimeter of brainstem is in, uh, valuable. But we have to keep in our mind that how each case we have to think again. Because tumor or cavernoma or lesion give us some way to follow. We have to follow the lesion. And lesion has to give us idea to how we can go there. Otherwise, please, we should not use this term. And this is right-sided tumor in midbrain. And it's tegmentum tumor. I have now almost 50 uh, midbrain glioma. I do not have crus cerebri tumor. It looks like crus cerebri, but no. Tegmentum tumors or tectum tumors. And the tegmentum tumors are mostly benign. And the tractography can help us to give some information. After such a lectures about tractography, I have now much more hope for the future that I can do better surgery because I can now demonstrate only sensory motor fibers and superior cerebellar pedicle in the uh, midbrain, but in the brainstem, I uh, tractography perform five structures. But if I can show the cranial nerves within the uh, brainstem, I should do better surgery. I should be better surgeon and young generation, you have to be ready for this. This is very primitive tractography, what we saw today, but it gave me some idea. So I go through lateral and you see superior cerebellar peduncle also pushed backward. I never seen any tumor invade the superior cerebellar peduncle in midbrain. It just pushed. And I go through the supracerebellar approach because when you release CSF, you can reach the midbrain. I don't use soft temporal. And this is lateral position. I prefer again the semi sitting, but now with the MRI, uh, intraoperative MRI, I have to use this position. Anyway, I don't have time, but in two minutes, I am there. So, and the tumor was on the surface almost. And after this is resection, and this is the tegmentum tumor, go through the supracerebellar approach and the sensory and motor fibers are almost intact after surgery and the cerebellar, superior cerebellar peduncle is normal also. Another case that I have to give uh, focus uh, on about the flare images. If you look at these flare images, I said I cannot operate this patient. It looks like everywhere is tumor. But again, keep in your mind, the brain stem, most of the brain, diffuse pontangulioma is another story, but most of the brain stem tumors are very uh, localized tumors. And if you look at this everywhere is tumor, I thought that I cannot remove, but look at this very simple tractography when we compare with what we saw today. But I saw that superior cerebellar peduncle pushed laterally. And I saw that the sensory and motor fibers pushed totally anteriorly. It's terrible. This is uh, not high quality tractography, but they are there. So, so I have to remove this and to do the in semi sitting position between uvula and tonsil. And this is three months later after surgery. You see the flare images. I did not give anything, but the old midbrain is normal now. Still with MRI, we cannot tell what is edema, what is tumor invasion, what is what, what is what. 
still there, there is limitations, at least in my knowledge. And it was after resection. And you see cerebellar peduncle, superior cerebellar is totally normal. Inferior and uh, middle not affected. And sensory and motor fibers are now well. And last case, it looks, is again five years old female, left sided slight hemiparesis, and six nerve palsy, and seven paresis. When you look at this, it looks like diffuse pontine glioma or GBM or something. But look at this. First of all, diffuse pontine gliomas, even if it goes everywhere, it stays in the pons. It doesn't go to midbrain or it doesn't go to uh, middle of longata in most of the cases. There are some cases, very rare. Midbrain tumors stay in midbrain. Pons tumors stay in pons. Mid, uh, middle of longata tumors stay in middle of longata. In 95, more than 95% of cases. And also, this is, look at this, this is midbrain. This is middle of longata tumor, not pontine tumor. Pons is just pushed. Another story about middle of longata tumors, they are from one side. Even it looks like everywhere is tumor, they are from one side. And you see the sensory and motor fibers just pushed totally laterally. And this is after resection. I, it looks like I removed all brain stem. This is now 12 years after surgery. It was pilostic astrocytoma. It was from right-sided middle of longata in one corner. And she's in the same condition now. Pilostic astrocytoma. So I like to just give one point statement to young generation. This is from Cardiff University. Look at the beauty of the new tractography is coming with seven Tesla. We have to be ready for this. This tractography will provide so much detail that we have to be better neurosurgeon, not just putting a tube to brain. Can you put a tube to this, this information? Please don't do it. This information is coming. It will be available maybe in soon. But we have to be better surgeon. A younger generation should learn, train, and innovate to advance of micro neurosurgery. And post-operative imaging will be much less forgiving. We will see every detail. One thing about silent brain. It's very common terminology now. I don't know what is it meaning. Is that part of the brain silent because there is no function or we don't hear? Today we cannot hear. Our monitoring is very primitive. Imagine we cannot hear a dog whistle, but that does not mean that there is no sound. There is sound each part of the brain, but we don't hear well in these days. In the future, I hope you will be able to hear. Just we have to respect. In conclusion, we have many new tools in our hands and I'm very happy to use all of them and I have all of them, but still we are dealing with the human brain. It is a holy organ and still neurosurgery is just starting. We have to do better neurosurgeon. You have to be much better neurosurgeon. And we cannot trust these kind of things. We have to put all this information together and, and then we can decide what we can do for our patients. And nothing is easy. And I like to thank all of my team and also especially Dr. Abuzer is now in director of our laboratory and you are more than welcome anytime to work in the lab. And just to remind you that this year I was planning to do this Congress, but because of COVID-19, we cannot do it. I hope we will do it next June. And because the 
future of microneurosurgery is depends of young generation. We have, you have to improve micro techniques. You have to improve micro neurosurgical anatomic information. That's what I learned today uh, from all of you. Uh, I'm very happy to follow your great contribution. I thank you so much. Well, Professor Ture, that was absolutely amazing. I enjoyed every second of your lecture. Um, you mentioned before, but if you ask me, I've, you know, I've been watching lecture after lecture since this morning, 8 a.m. here, and it's 2 a.m. now. So it's been a long day. And this is my favorite lecture of all of those that I've seen, because it's inspiring, it's, it's, it's at the same time as what this meeting is about, which is tradition and, inno and innovation, both of them at the same time. And I'm sure, you know, many of us have been greatly inspired by your work for many years. So thank you so much, Uber. Um, thank you, thank you, Juan. I am very happy to be to listen all of you today. I am the luckiest surgeon. Thank you. Thank you so much. With this, dear friends, we conclude. It's been a phenomenal marathon day. Next weekend, we continue again. It will be Friday, 5 p.m. California time, but it will be probably for you guys Saturday morning uh, or in the middle of the night, I'm not sure. Uh, so we'll continue with another group of sessions that will be exciting too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. 